All righty. Good afternoon. Today is Thursday, October 1st. Uh, today we are going to finish our discussion of the endocrine system and its histology. And I hope to have some time at the end for a uh, review for the exam. Again, I uh, know it is uh, unusual, but we have an assignment due on Monday. Uh, by 6 p.m., you need to get your outline for your presentations turned in. Again, I want one file. It doesn't mean it has to be one page. It can be 17 pages, although that doesn't sound like much of an outline for a 12-page uh, talk. But the point is, however many pages your outline is, I want it condensed down into one PDF file. And again, I've been asked it a couple times by email and in office hours. Again, I want one outline for the whole group. If your group has three people, I don't want three different outlines uh, for your three different parts. Combine them into one file. Uh, turn that into one PDF, and that is what you're going to turn in. And make sure your outlines have the names of all the students in your group and the name of your disorder on it. And again, it has to be turned in by October 5th by 6 p.m. Do not forget. As soon as you get it done, submit it. Uh, so that it's in there. Uh, if you're not 100% sure, submit it. And then if you uh, make changes to it, then submit a new one. Because uh, again, if you turn it in late or you don't submit it, you are going to lose 10 points off of your 50 point presentation. And that is a huge chunk. So I want to make sure these are available for people to look at and prepare for the presentations on Tuesday. So make sure you get that done. And on Tuesday, we will do the presentations. Uh, we'll randomly select uh, the order on Tuesday so that uh, we'll go one section at a time and work through all of that. Uh, leading up to uh, then your lab and lecture exam on Thursday. And again, you know the format of that, exact same format as the last one. Using Proctorio, you can complete them in either uh, order that you want, lab first and lecture, or lecture first and lab, but they must be completed between 12 and 4.35 p.m. All right, questions on any of that? This time you also recommend to do lab first? Um, again, I, I, the only thing that I, I don't recommend you do it in any order, what I, what I said in the past, and I guess it is still true, most of the problems that people have are problems with the lab exam because there are a lot of pictures in it and some of those files are larger. Uh, sometimes people get caught up on the loading of those files. And so most of the problems that I've seen people have, it has been with the lab exam. So if you know you've got an amazing computer with all the RAM you need and everything else that is necessary and, you know, uh, ripping fast uh, Wi-Fi and everything else and you want to do the lecture exam first, that's fine. If you have an older system or a slower modem or something along those lines and you're concerned that you may have problems, then, then it might be beneficial to do the lab exam first to make sure that you get over any of those hurdles that might be. Again, I would say so far this semester it's been pretty good. I can count the number of problems on uh, really three fingers uh, so far for uh, the semester, so it hasn't been too bad. Um, but again, if there's nothing wrong with being cautious, but again, there is no set order. You can do it in whatever order you're comfortable with. All righty. Any other questions? All righty then. Let's pick up where we left off. We were working our way through the endocrine system, gland by gland, uh, talking about uh, the classes and specific hormones that are made, what their targets, what their effects, how they're regulated, and also looking at the histology, as well as the gross anatomy for these as we've been working our way through them. So let's continue that. We left off the last discussion uh, talking about the, uh, the master endocrine gland, the pituitary gland, and then also uh, the hypothalamus, which controls it. But there are other endocrine glands, and uh, one of the uh, important ones is this one here. Uh, this is the thyroid gland, as you can see on this illustration. Uh, it is inferior to the larynx. In fact, this big, huge shield-like structure with the laryngeal prominence that we commonly refer to as the Adam's apple is known as the thyroid cartilage because it is just uh, superior to the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is a two-lobed gland with a small narrow isthmus that connects the two lobes together. It wraps around three quarters of the trachea. It does not go all the way around and meet in the back. Instead, there is an opening in the back and actually one of our charts does a good job of showing this. I wonder, let me think. 
I don't think I have it in the lecture, but let me double check that. If not, I have a good idea of where we might be able to find it. Well, we do have an illustration, but let's do this. There we go. That's what I want. No, oh, perfect. This shows a couple things that I want. Excellent. Perfect. So this is the uh, half head chart that we have in the classroom that we've talked about before and looked at on numerous occasions. This is useful to talk about here because we've also talked about it in terms of our lymphatic system. So if you remember, when we talked about our lymphatic system, uh, this up here, any idea what this structure up here might be? It's a tonsil, I forgot which one now. Excellent, which tonsil? You get partial credit for tonsil on the exam, but if you want full credit, there you go, pharyngeal, or what or it's commonly referred to as the adenoids. This big white one here then would be the... Lingual. Tonsil. Lingual tonsil. And you can kind of see a little bit of the palatine here, although it's not a very good uh, view of it. Here is a better view of that palatine tonsil. Remember, as we talked about, it is in that indentation between these two arches. Do you need to know these arches for this exam? I don't remember. I know you have to for the uh, digestive system. I don't remember if it's on your list for this one. Is it on your list for this one? If only someone had the anatomy. Well, I'll mention them anyway, and then you feel free to ignore them if they're not on your list. Palatoglossal and palatopharyngeal arches form this indentation known as the fossa. And inside this fossa is where you find the palatine tonsils. And one of the best views of this is actually this view right here. Notice with a transverse section right through the mouth, we see the palatoglossal arch, we see the platopharyngeal arch, and then these uh, little pink pieces of chewed up chewing gum on the side are indeed those palatine tonsils. We also see the lingual tonsils really nicely on this as well. However, what I want to show you is this picture right here. Notice this is actually a posterior view. So you're looking at the uh, neck from the back. There we see that little dangly thing in the back of your throat. Uh, and the epiglottis is located here. Uh, but what I wanna show you right here is the two lobes of our thyroid gland. So you see that they don't come all the way around to the back of the neck. We just have uh, these two big lobes that we see there. All right. So it doesn't go all the way around. And we'll come back to that picture in just a minute. All right. As I mentioned, one of the nice things about the endocrine system is that the histology for all the tissues that you're responsible for look very different from each other. It's kind of the opposite of the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system, everything has a lymphatic follicle. So we really had to kind of look at what else was going around in the slide to really figure out what we were looking at. Here, we have this very, very characteristically distinct tissue to the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland is one of the few endocrine glands that stores a massive amount of its hormone, right? Hormones are big, powerful chemical signals. So typically we don't have a large number of them stored uh, in the gland, right? We make it as we need it. The thyroid gland has practically a month's worth of its hormones stored inside of these huge uh, vesicles, basically, these huge follicles that are formed. So notice we have these simple cuboidal cells that form these massive follicles, and these follicles are filled with colloid. And this colloid has a massive amount of our thyroid hormones. Your book actually does an amazing job of talking about how this hormone is made and stored and how it is extracted from this follicle and used. 
Uh, it is a great, very interesting story. I am not holding you responsible for it on this exam. We have so many other processes that while it's uh, interesting, it isn't necessarily useful for our purposes. So I encourage you uh, to read it because it's interesting, but it's not gonna be on the exam. But we're able to store massive, massive amounts, almost a month's worth of our thyroid hormones uh, that are going to be located in here. And there are primarily two main types of hormones that are produced here in the thyroid gland. The first is our class of hormones, uh, the thyroid hormones. They are amino acid based. And again, this is another thing your book talks about. While these are amino acid based, these actually are lipid soluble. So they are actually able to enter into the cell and it actually has a different mechanism by which it influences the cell. Again, very interesting stuff. Your book does a nice job talking about it, but we're not gonna focus too much on it. We're not gonna, again, the sky's blue in this class and we don't have time to go into all the minutiae of detail. We could literally spend a whole semester talking just about the endocrine system. But our thyroid hormone is a class of hormones that are again, lipid soluble. And there are two main types, two main specific types. Those two specific types are thyroxine and triiodothyronine. Um, do you need to know that it's lipid soluble? Yes. Do you need to know that it is uh, the exact mechanism by which it affects the cell? No. The two thyroid hormones are thyroxine, T4, and triiodothyronine, T3. They are called T4 and T3 because they contain iodines. Thyroxine contains four of them. Triiodothyronine contains three of them. Now, these are two different hormones with subtly different functions. But for the most part, and so for us, because the sky is blue, the function of the two hormones are essentially the same. So we won't worry about emphasizing the subtle differences between the two of them. We'll just think of them in general as what it is that they do collectively, All right? And the real key to these thyroid hormones, one of the things that makes them so important, one of the reasons why we have so much of it stored is because what cells of the body does it target? Most. Yeah, damn near every one. Absolutely. These cells have the ability to affect and influence almost every cell in the body. Now, even though they're lipid soluble, even though they're able to enter the cell, they're still amino acid based. And because they're amino acid based, their effect is to increase overall metabolism. It can also increase blood pressure. It can also increase body temperature. All right? I'm trying to remember the groups that we have. I think we have at least one group who's dealing with a thyroid disorder. But there are basically two main thyroid disorders, one where you overproduce these hormones. And what would that general class of disorder be known as? Hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism. People with hyperthyroidism tend to be incredibly tall. In fact, large amounts of these thyroid hormones actually keep the growth plates from closing. We make cartilage so fast that the growth plates aren't closed. So in the Guinness Book of World Records, all of the tallest people that have ever been on there are people who have had hyperthyroidism. They grow their entire life. Uh, there was a lot of speculation at the time, and again, I know this is still somewhat of a dated reference now, but back in ancient times, there was a, uh, a, a, a gentleman from China who came over to play in the NBA, uh, Yao Ming. And he was massively tall, went and played for the Rockets, and, there was, and um, uh, China was very uh, hesitant to release his medical uh, information, and there was a lot of speculation at the time that he had been someone who had suffered from hyperthyroidism, which is why he was over seven feet tall, uh, but then had had it surgically removed and fixed. Um, I, like I said, at the time they were less willing to come out, more information has come out since then, and there, but there's still speculation that there could be multiple causes for, for what uh, his disorder was or is.
Um, whereas conversely, if someone underproduces these, that would be hypothyroidism. Those people tend to be very lethargic, uh, tend to be small, tend to not thrive as well as a result of that type of condition as well. So these are incredibly important hormones, uh, which is why we store so much of them, and also why iodine, iodine is so important. Uh, one of the major issues that we used to have is that iodine is not equally distributed throughout the uh, crust of the earth in the United States. And so as a result of that, uh, some areas uh, would have more iodine in their food than others. And so there were areas of the country where people were failing to thrive because of the lack of iodine. So of course, what did they do to resolve that? Take supplements or- uh... True, they can make supplements, but where's, where do you find most iodine these days? Salt. Salt, yeah, it's almost impossible to buy salt now that doesn't have iodine in it. Uh, so that's what they did. They, one of the major things that the government did at that time was to iodize the salt, uh, require the salt making manufacturers to put iodine in their salt so that people would be able to get that micronutrient and would be able to thrive as a result. Now, of course, we have one more important question about these thyroid hormones, and that is how are they regulated? Excellent. And you would get partial credit for that on an exam, Alex. There you go. Hormonally via thyroid stimulating hormone. Perfect. All right. Questions on that? All right. Let me see if I have my pretty picture here. No, I do not. Okay. Let's cheat and go back to my pretty picture here. Yes, for both. Their targets, their functions, their regulation is the same for both of them. All right. Now, notice as we go back here, and I'm going to emphasize this with my highlighter, pick a nice dark color. All right. We have our follicular cells that form the follicles, and more follicular cells that are forming the follicles and more follicular cells that are forming the follicles. And these follicular cells are the ones that make and release our thyroid hormones. But if you will notice, and I will make my highlighter a little lighter here, there are some cells that are not a part of the follicle, tend to be a little larger, a little lighter in color. And these cells that are a little larger and a little lighter of color are not part of the follicles, and they are called parafollicular cells. And these parafollicular cells produce an entirely different hormone. Nope, not calcitonin. That's what we're talking about right now. Thyroxine, uh, tri thyroxine and triiodothyronine are produced by those follicular cells, right? Have the same function, have the same targets, have the same regulation. Calcitonin is produced by a completely different cell in the thyroid gland. And it has a completely different target. Right, whoops. Calcitonin may have been something that we talked about way back in 430 when we talked about regulating bone density. One of the things that calcitonin does is it targets the osteoclasts, inhibiting the osteoclasts. What's the function of that? What's the advantage of that? Why would we want to inhibit osteoclasts? To let the bones grow? Well, okay, true. Part of it could be to increase bone growth. But as we've talked about many times in the class, when it comes to growing density of the bone, sure, that is an advantage. It would increase bone density. But what's the other reason, and probably the more important reason, is it's going to play a role in regulating calcium levels in the blood. Right, If fewer osteoclasts are breaking down matrix, less calcium is being released into the blood. And so as a result of that, it is going to decrease calcium levels in the blood. Excellent. We see that effect on the calcium levels in the blood with the other targets of calcitonin as well. Anybody else remember what the other two targets of calcitonin is? 
kidney. Kidney, excellent. One target is the kidney. And what does it tell the kidney to do? To reabsorb, uh, oh, to produce calcitriol. No, not exactly. Well, uh, so we'll talk about calcitriol in just a second. But what does calcitonin tell the kidney to do? What does the kidney normally do? Um, normally we, reabsorb, normally we, go ahead. Reabsorb or uh, make a urine. Or... Yeah, exactly. We produce 200 liters of filtrate. And remember the job of the kidney is not just to produce that filtrate, but to reabsorb 99% of it. So in this case, what calcitonin tells the kidney to do is to stop reabsorbing Of calcium. Instead of bringing calcium back, the calcitonin tells the kidney, let that calcium leave in the urine. So more calcium leaves the body in the urine, and of course that is going to decrease calcium levels in the blood. And as someone mentioned, it also is going to indirectly affect the digestive system. The digestive system job is to absorb nutrients, including calcium. But for our digestive system to absorb calcium, there was something that was needed. And now you can say it again. What's that thing that our digestive system needs to absorb calcium? I think, Oksana, I think you already said it once. Oh. That somebody said it. What's the hormone that tells the digestive system to absorb calcium? Calcitriol. Calcitriol, excellent. All right, and for those of you who don't remember that, calcitriol is the active form of what? Vitamin D3. Vitamin D, there you go, excellent. It is the active form of vitamin D. So a calcitriol tells the digestive system to absorb calcium. Well, what calcitonin does is it inhibits calcitriol production, or really activation. And if we have less calcitriol, our digestive system absorbs less calcium. Our kidney is letting the calcium go. We're inhibiting the osteoclast, so less calcium is broken down. So overall, notice all of these effects. Its job is to lower calcium levels in the blood. All right. So the overall effect is to lower calcium levels in the blood. As I have said many times in 430 and 431, calcium makes cells do wonky things. And so it is vitally important that we maintain tight control of it. You know, I'm not huge on numbers. There are numbers occasionally that you need to memorize, but a lot of times numbers are just useful for wooing women. Right, like for instance, the regular levels of calcium in your blood, right? You walk up to a woman at a bar, right? And you saddle up next to her and you say, hey, do you know the normal levels of calcium in your blood are 8.5 uh, milligrams per deciliter to 11.5 milligrams per deciliter? And they just swoon when you say stuff like that, right? But, while these numbers are not something you need to memorize, what I do like about them is it points out to you how restrictive that range is for calcium, how vitally important it is, how small and narrow that functional range for calcium is. It is very, very challenging, right, to keep it within that range. And so we need to keep really, really tight control of it. And calcitonin is one of the main ways we do that. All right. Now, as I mentioned, these are produced by those parafollicular cells, the ones outside the follicle, so a different cell within the gland. 
And not surprisingly then, it is gonna be regulated differently as well. How is calcitonin levels going to be regulated in the blood? Immoral. Okay, and you get partial credit for that on the exam. What do you need for the other part of the, uh, the point? Hormonal. No, humoral, the uh, calcium levels. All right. What we're doing is we monitor calcium levels in the blood. Where might we do something like that? If only in, for in the first section where we talked about the uh, cardiovascular system, we talked about a location, or really two locations, where there are a large number of baroreceptors and chemoreceptors that allow us to monitor the condition of the blood. Did we find a couple places like that in the cardiovascular system? In the aortic arch. All right, in the aortic arch, there are the aortic bodies. And what other bodies did we find? Carotid, excellent. Where the common carotid branches into the internal and external is where those carotid bodies were located as well. So in places like the aortic bodies and the carotid bodies, we monitor the amount of calcium that's in the blood, send that signal to our thyroid gland so that we can control uh, the release of calcitonin to regulate calcium levels. Excellent. Questions on that? So again, two different types of hormones produced from two different types of cells. We have our follicular cells that form the follicles that contain the colloid. And then in the space in between, we have these larger, lighter cytoplasm cells that are those parafollicular cells. They're the ones that produce calcitonin. So what is the cavity in this thyroid gland? Because on the uh, list, I, I see cavity space. Well, the space, the space would be this colloid-filled space, right? The follicle, this is a fluid-filled space. This follicle is a fluid. We basically have taken a simple cuboidal epithelial tissue, rolled it up into a follicle, that has a space in the middle. However, that space is filled with a colloid, basically a fluid with suspended hormones in it. All right, that's what a colloid is. Some, you know, fluid with things suspended in it. Fun with the vocabulary. Okay. All right? Yes. Excellent. All right, now, if we look at that posterior view, and here we have another nice posterior view uh, that we are looking at here, uh, we can see the back of the thyroid gland associated with the thyroid gland, but different from the thyroid gland, are these clusters of cells that form glands collectively on the posterior part of the thyroid. These are not a part of the thyroid, right? Both the follicular cells and parafollicular cells are part of the thyroid. This is a second gland that is adjacent to, held to the thyroid gland by connective tissue. But there are different cells producing different hormones. This picture shows four of them. However, we can have anywhere between, oh, I thought I had that on there. Sorry, we can have anywhere between six and eight of these. Most of them are on the thyroid gland, but some of them can actually be located uh, on the muscle that surrounds the esophagus or even on the wall of the trachea or in the surrounding connective tissue. And remember, I promised we would come back to this posterior view again of our uh, head, throat, and mouth. And if you look closely, let's change the color to make it easier to see. Here, here, and here are these structures that, especially with these, kind of look a little bit like they may be lymph nodes, but those are not lymph nodes. Those are actually the parathyroid glands, and these are the blood vessels that carry away their, their hormones. So these structures on the posterior side of the thyroid are the para 
thyroid glands. And when we look at this histologically, we see that they are distinctly different. So our parathyroid gland produces our parathyroid hormone. Again, anybody remember from 430 what the targets, really this should say targets, plural, are for the parathyroid gland? Also skeleton and kidney. There you go, exactly. Uh, bone, but again, in specifically, so let's put bone in parentheses, because specifically it also targets the osteoclast. It is also going to affect the kidney. And it also is going to indirectly affect oops, the digestive system. So it is going to be similar to the uh, calcitonin in that it has the same three targets. But does it have the same three effects? No. What does parathyroid hormone do to the osteoclasts? Does it inhibit them like calcitonin does? No, it excites them. And of course, that is going to release more calcium into the blood. What does it tell the kidney to do? There you go, the opposite exam, opposite of calcitonin. So it is going to tell the kidney to reabsorb more calcium. And of course, that is going to increase calcium levels Oops. in the blood. And, oops, oh no, there you go. It stimulates the production of calcitriol, causing calcitriol to be produced. And of course, that tells the digestive system to absorb more calcium. So of course, net effect of parathyroid hormone is to increase calcium levels in the blood. And again, if you want to keep precise control of your temperature in your house, you need both a heater and an air conditioner. One to bring it up, one to bring it down, and that allows you precision. And that is exactly what we have here with calcitonin and parathyroid hormone. One brings calcium levels down, one brings calcium levels up, and that leaves us, lets, allows us to, uh, blah, 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 allows us to maintain very precise control of calcium, which as we said, is very, very important. All right. Questions on that? It's regulated by humoral uh, activity via, um calcium level in blood. There you go. Regulated humorally via calcium levels. Now, we have talked about the gland, but we have not looked at it histologically. So let's do that. Notice here, we very again clearly see some follicles. And these colloid filled follicles are a dead giveaway you are looking at the thyroid gland. So we see that here. But then notice there is a very thick, very distinct septum, connective tissue septum, that actually separates the parathyroid gland from the thyroid gland. And this looks much more uniform. Notice there is no follicles, there are no colloids in this space. And mostly what you see are these very dark, distinct cells. And what do you think these dark, distinct cells might be called? Oxyphil? Nope, try again. Oxyphil? No, wait, not, the, not the oxyphil. Is there another cell listed there? Chief cell? Chief cells. These are all the chief cells. And guess what chief cells do?
Not your question. Guess what chief cells do? They um, secrete the... Well, this is a gland that makes a hormone. Guess what the chief cells do? Secretes the hormone. Yeah, it makes and releases the hormone. The chief cells are what make and release the parathyroid hormone. Now, as you see in this parathyroid gland, the majority of the cells are indeed chief cells. But if you notice, occasionally there are these cells like this that have a larger and much more clear lumen. One of the th interesting things that happens as we age, these cells become even more numerous. So here we saw very few of them. Here we see a bit more. And again, notice I'm not talking about this here. This right here oops, is an adipocyte, right? That right there, I don't know, I'm stupid. Give me my highlighter back. This is an adipocyte, right? That's an adipocyte. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about these cells that have these large, very clear uh, lumens to them. And notice as we age, they become even more noticeable. And notice in this case, a large number of these cells are these big, huge, clear cells. Again, not the adipocytes. Here's an adipocyte, here's an adipocyte, here's an adipocyte. We're not talking about those. But over here are the chief cells, and over here are a different type of cell. And guess what this different type of cell that we get more and more of as we age happen to be? Oxy. Now you can say it. Oxophils, excellent. And what do the oxophils do? No, really, I'm asking because nobody knows, so I'm hoping maybe you do. Anyone know what oxophils do? No one seems to know. No one seems to have any idea what these oxophils do. We know that we accumulate more of them as we age, but why they're there, what they do, is not something that we fully understand. Ah, which brings me to another great point. No, not necessarily. We don't produce less parathyroid hormone as we age, so it doesn't seem to affect the function that way. Notice, let's go back here, right? For those of you who didn't see, because I jumped to it right away, so let's cheat. I found that chart on the Cosumnes River uh, College Virtual Anatomy Lab. This has some really great resources that can be useful for you, including having many of the charts that are in the classroom. Our lymphatic chart is here. I believe we've looked at our lymphatic chart here, but it also has the endocrine chart. When we look at the endocrine chart, here it shows this chart that has some of the pictures in it, and as you go through it, uh, some more different things that it can show you, some of the different glands. We used this when we were talking about our pituitary gland, anterior and posterior part of it, and the infundibulum and the hypothalamus. We looked at this picture that shows the different regions of it. We saw that. Uh, this is the pancreas. We'll talk about that in a second. Right here's our thyroid and parathyroid again. But, ah, this is what I wanted to show you. Notice this is our artist's representation Yes, you don't need to worry about what the oxyphils do. You do need to be able to recognize them. This is our artist's rendition of the parathyroid gland. Notice they've very clearly shown smaller cells and larger cells with the occasional adipocytes and some blood vessels. So this is indeed clearly the parathyroid gland. But remember, one of the key characteristics about the oxyphils is that they're very light in color. And so, of course, what did our artists do for us? Make it darker. Made them more dark, exactly. My guess is that, again, and I'm totally hypothesizing here, my guess is they did it to differentiate it from the adipocytes, just so that these are noticeably different, but it was a crummy choice that they made. So even though this is clearly not the right color, at least they've done a nice job of distinguishing the two types of cells for us. So again, this is, you know, like many things on these charts, there's good and bad, and unfortunately, occasional artistic license that we do have to worry about. All right, so there we see that. Uh, 
Well, artists, I don't know. I think artists are just stupid. I don't think artists hate us. I don't think they mean to be this way, right? They're, you know, they're, they're misunderstood and they're put upon. And so they, uh, they just, they always have to have their own take on things. So I think artists are just stupid. Anatomists, they're mean. Anatomists are horrible, horrible people. But artists, I think, are just stupid. <laughs> Hopefully none of you know artists, are artists. Oh, and then here we see a nice pretty picture of, oh, another fun artistic representation thing. Here is our uh, thyroid gland, clearly. See the follicular cells really, really well. See the colloid filled follicles in space. And then notice the parafollicular cells, they've almost kind of made look like smooth muscle, these kind of spindle shaped elongated cells. So again, it's kind of a weird representation for what a parafollicular cell is, but at least again, they've made it clearly look different from the follicular cells. So you can clearly see these differently. Uh, the white dots. Oh, I think that's, so one of the things you have to remember is that often when, not often, when we process tissues, we freeze the tissue, we slice the tissue, we put it on a stage, we use all sorts of chemicals. And one of the things that occurs during that process is there is a dehydration of the tissue. So it is not uncommon when you look at the uh, thyroid gland under the microscope that the colloid will have air sacs in it from that dehydration process. So you can see some stippling of the colloid or some collapsing of the colloid because of the dehydration of it. As you draw out water, it shrivels that fluid a little bit. And so that's what I think they're trying to represent. They're trying to make it look a little bit more realistic because that commonly happens when you look at the histology slides. You'll see some air pockets that form in there from the dehydration process of it. All righty, excellent. So, Questions on the thyroid gland or the uh, thyroid gland or the parathyroid glands? Anatomy, microanatomy, function, anything like that. All right, excellent. For the first time, we get to look at our pancreas. We will look at it again when we get to the digestive system. Uh, the pancreas is one of our major mixed glands. And what, of course, do I mean by a mixed gland? Both exocrine and endocrine. Yeah, it has both exocrine and endocrine functions. Absolutely. If we cheat and go back to the pretty picture from our textbook, I mean from the chart, again, well, although here they've cut it, it is this feather-shaped um, organ where the head, actually I don't like this picture, let's see, I bet. Bring this down there, go back here. Where would it be? Um, Need a good torso picture. That's not gonna do it. Hmm. Guess they don't have just an overview of the torso system, right? I'm not sure where that would be located. We'll play and see if we can find it later. Uh, but it is this nice feather-shaped structure. Its head is be there. That one. No. That's closer, but I want the rest of them. No, nope. yeah, see, it doesn't show it. All right, I'm not going to bother taking the wasting the time to go looking for it now. But. Um, pancreas is this nice feather shaped organ. The head of it is surrounded by the beginning of the small intestine, the duodenum. Uh, it is in that uh, a retrograde region and then it's got this tail like structure that comes out from there. And it, as we mentioned it is a mixed gland. So in this it has two different components. Notice the vast majority of our pancreas 
are these very tight, darkly stained, uh, ball-shaped secretory structures. These are the glandular components of our pancreas. These are the pancreatic acini. Remember, an acini is a ball-shaped secretory structure, and it is responsible for producing all of the pancreatic juices that are released into the small intestine. So it is releasing it outside of the body and plays a vital role in digestion. However, like islands in a stream, because that is what we are, we have these small little islands or islets of these light colored cells dotting the landscape of our pancreas. And these structures are our endocrine components. These endocrine components of the pancreas, known as the pancreatic islets, produce four major hormones. I'm gonna only hold you responsible for two of them. Now, I'm gonna cheat, because I think I have it here. Hold on, do, do, here we go, perfect. Here we see an up close view of a pancreatic islet. Uh, and this islet has been used multiple very expensive, very fancy stains. So we can clearly see there are four main types of cells found in the pancreatic islets. Alpha cells, beta cells, delta cells, and gamma cells. The problem is, as I mentioned, they used like three or four different stains on this. Two of them are incredibly expensive. So a lot of time when you look at these, you see them as looking something like this. Here, notice we can still very clearly tell the difference from all the pancreatic acini that are around here and this islet that is located here. And again, these pancreatic islets are also sometimes called the islets of Langerhan. And of course, why are they called the islets of Langerhan? Good old Bob. Anybody know what this is here? Here's a good question. Extra credit. What is this structure right here? Oxyphil? No, not a bad guess. Nope. All right, no extra credit, but I will give you a hint. All right, what would I get excited about? Being a neuroanatomist. It's a nerve. There you go, exactly. That is a nerve. Excellent. But so notice with this particular stain, is it as easy to tell the four cells apart? No, right? So I'm not gonna hold you responsible for being able to histologically distinguish every single cell of this pancreatic islet. However, you do need to know what the two cells that make the two hormones you are responsible for are. The first of those are our beta cells. Beta cells are the cells that produce insulin. We've already talked about insulin a little bit, but let's go over it again. What cells does insulin influence? Most cells. Yeah, most cells, but in particular the liver. Any other cells that it is in particular likely to highly affect and emphasize? Not so much blood cells, but what else? Muscle. Muscle, exactly. So insulin is going to, be going to affect most of the cells in the body, especially muscle, especially liver, and especially our adipose. Adipocytes. And it tells those cells of the body to take glucose and store it inside, right? Like we talked about, it tells the adipose to store it as triglycerides. It tells the liver and muscle to store them as, glyc as, a, as a glycogen, right? And what that does is that helps to lower the, blood, uh, lower the glucose levels of the blood, all right? Now, how do you think this would be regulated? Humorally via glucose levels? There you go, exactly. Humorally via glucose. Excellent. The second hormone produced by the pancreas you're going to be responsible for is glucagon. 
Glucagon is uh, released by the alpha cells. And anyone know what glucagon targets? Liver primarily. Yeah, primarily the liver, telling the liver to release glucose. Right, its job is to release glucose, right? So you're sitting here listening to me talk for an hour and a half and straight without a break. And again, these uh, analogies make more sense when we're in the classroom, because if you're in the classroom, you wouldn't be able to eat or drink during that time. Now you could all be shoving your faces for all I know, and I'm guessing that's why you all have your cameras off, right? Just eating popcorn and enjoying the show. Uh, but if you're not able to eat for long periods of time or while you're fasting or at night while you're sleeping, as blood glucose levels drop, uh, your alpha cells release glucagon that is going to go to the liver and tell the liver to break down some of that glycogen and release it into the blood, helping to bring glucose levels back up. So again, we have this tight control of glucose levels. One brings it down, one brings it up, and that gives us that tight control. And therefore, of course, how also is glucagon going to be uh, regulated? That's insulin. I'm sorry? That's insulin, humorally via glucose level. Exactly. Just like insulin, it is regulated humorally via glucose levels. Perfect. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. Here is where things get really fun. We are next going to talk about the adrenal gland. There is a lot of anatomy and a lot of vocabulary on this one. So I think this is a good starting point so we can come at this fresh and ready. Uh, my watch says 102, so let's go ahead and take our break. Uh, we will take our first break. Uh, we will come back and restart at 117. And I will start the recording at that point. All righty, any questions before we take our first break? All right, excellent, see you in 15 minutes. All righty. Any questions before we get started? All right, I'm gonna steal a little corner of this picture. Hopefully you guys can see it. Uh, as we know, we are now talking about the adrenal glands or what are also known as the suprarenal glands because they sit on top of the kidney. All right, so there is a kidney. And uh, again, sitting on top of it is this triangular structure, and no, these are not drawn to scale. Um, that is the adrenal gland. And as we've talked about, there are two key divisions to the adrenal gland, a chewy nougat center and a candy-coated outer shell. And we see that here. Here we see that division with a deep area and a superficial area. And what do we call that deep area again? Medulla. Excellent, this is the medulla. Oops, Oops that's all right. And the medulla of the adrenal gland is comprised of nervous tissue. A little smaller. Perfect. And the outer region, what would that be? Cortex. Cortex. And the cortex is made up of glandular tissue. But there are a couple other key differences between these two regions as well. Not only is the medulla nervous tissue, but this nervo tissue, nervous tissue produces amino acid based hormones. Whereas here in the cortex is the first location where we have talked about where we produce lipid based hormones. And I want you to notice one other thing about the cortex as well. The cortex, and I'll use a highlighter this time to emphasize it, has three distinct regions. As we can see, even at this low magnification, there is a more dark stained region right here next to the medulla. There is a darker stained region right here up near the top. And then this lighter stained a stained region in between. 
And then of course, like many organs that we have seen, there is also that hard for fibrous outer layer known as the fibrous capsule as well. Now, too often when you look at illustrations of this or models of this or things along those lines, they show superficial to deep, which is how we are going to look at the adrenal gland, but they always put superficial at the top and deep at the bottom. But being a completely triangular, as you can see, notice here, if we were to take a section through it this way, superficial would be down here to the bottom right and deep would be to the top left. Whereas over here, it would be uh, from left to right and over here it would be from right to left and so on and so forth. So one of the important things to do when you're orienting yourself is to find that thin fibrous outer capsule. If you can find that thin fibrous outer capsule, you know you are always superficial and then you'll be able to clearly see the three regions, one, two, three regions or zones of the cortex and then the fourth area, which is the medulla. Now all four of these regions produce different classes of hormones with different functions and they are regulated differently as well. All right. We'll worry about them histologically in just a minute. We'll come back and look at these at a closer magnification. But what I want to do first is go to the whiteboard and go through this together. See the anatomy of this. So for simplicity's sake, I am going to take a, a horizontal section through the adrenal gland. And so what that means is that my fibrous capsule is going to be right here. So this is my fibrous capsule. And if this is the fibrous capsule, then uh, what is the orientation of that? How does that relate to the uh, location of the uh, adrenal gland? Are we superficial, are we deep, what are we? Superficial. Superficial. And so then way down here, and I guess I gotta move that down there so it's out of my way. Um, I don't know where we can put this. I'm gonna put this up here for now. And then that obviously makes this over here deep. Excellent. Now, obviously, as we mentioned, the very first division, and I'm gonna use the highlighter for this to emphasize this, is going to be that border between the cortex. So we've got the cortex up here, and then we've got the medulla down here. Now, the medulla, as we mentioned, is comprised of nervous tissue. As I mentioned, it produces amino acid-based hormones. And specifically, it produces a class of hormones. What is the class of hormones that is produced by the adrenal medulla? Epinephrine and norepinephrine? No, those aren't the class. Those would be the specific types. So what would the class of hormones be? Okay. Catecholamines? Catecholamines. <clears throat> There we go, produces a class of hormones called catecholamines, but you are right, there are primarily two specific types. They're actually close to five, six, uh, but there are two specific types, the two most common specific types, and the two you are responsible for are, of course, what? Epinephrine and norepinephrine. If you remember from 430, do we produce equal amounts of both of these here in our medulla? We didn't really distinguish them. I True, you're right, we didn't distinguish them, but what we did say is about 80% of what is produced is epinephrine. Oh, yes. 
investment, but you're right. From a functional standpoint, we did not uh, really differentiate them, but it is more epinephrine. We did at least mention that. From a functional standpoint, what are the targets? Well, let's start easier. What is the overall effect of epinephrine and norepinephrine? Why do we release epinephrine and norepinephrine into our blood? Increase heart rate. True, those are some of the specific effects, but in general, why do we release epinephrine and norepinephrine uh, as hormones into the body? The fight or flight? Yeah, part of the fight or flight response, right? This allows us to deal with our short-term stress response, right? As you mentioned, that fight or flight type of response, dealing with that short-term stress response, that fight or flight response. So absolutely, when you think of some of the possible targets, as you mentioned, it is gonna increase the heart rate. What else is it gonna do? Slow down digest, uh, the digestive system. Sure, inhibits digestion. Highlights blood vessels. Uh, all the blood vessels? Skeletal muscle. Right, it dilates some blood vessels and it constricts others. Right, those blood vessels going to places like the muscles, like the heart, like the lungs, like the liver, like the adipose, those are dilated because we want to go there to get resources. Whereas places to like digestive, places like the skin, they're constricting, right? And so on and so forth. We have talked about back in 430 when we talked about our autonomic nervous system, we talked about all of those fight or flight type responses, dilating the airways, dilating the pupils of the eyes, et cetera, et cetera. All of those targets that give us that short term stress response. So again, you don't necessarily have to list all of them, but you should at least at list at least two or three of the big important ones that go on with that. And let's make sure respiration, right? Dilates the bronchi. We talked about that and like I said, et cetera, et cetera from there. Now, of course, how is this regulated? Neurally by a sympathetic nervous system. Excellent. There you go. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple, pretty easy. All right. Questions on that one? All right, let's talk about the cortex then. As I mentioned, the cortex is comprised of glandular tissue. And here is where we produce are um, lipid-based hormones. One of the other keys to our cortex is that there are three distinct regions. So again, we'll take our highlighter, but we'll change the color to something like red or something like that so that we can divide it up into three distinct regions. Now, uh, in the interest of space for writing, I'm gonna divide them evenly. But as we saw from that previous picture, are they necessarily going to be equal amounts of all three of these within the region? No. No, excellent. So let's get names first. Anybody know the name of the superficial region of the cortex. Zona glomerulus. Excellent, zona glomerulosa. Question is why? What is, have we heard that term glomerulose before? Anyone remember where we heard that before? Glomerulus? Sound vaguely familiar to anyone? No. No. Way back, if you took me for 430, way back in 430 when we learned about the tissues, the very first tissue we looked at was the simple squamous epithelial tissue, and we looked at it in the kidney, where a sim or simple, stramous, blah, 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 simple squamous epithelial tissue helps to form a structure called a renal corpuscle. Mm -hmm. And inside that renal corpuscle is a special capillary called the glomerulus. 
It's okay if you never learned that or if you've forgotten that because when we get to the urinary system, you will get to learn it all over again. But the reason this area gets its name is glomerulus kind of means ball shape. And that's what's happening here. The secretary structures, the glandular structures in the zona glomerulosa have a ball shape appearance. So if we were to draw this, right, there's all these kind of ball shape glandular structures, almost kind of look like a sini where we have these ball shaped glandular structures, which apparently I'm drawing like pizzas, but you get the idea. All right, excellent. In our zona glomerulosa, we produce a class of hormones. What is the class of hormones that is produced in our zona glomerulosa? Mineral, mineral corticoids. Yep. Corticoids, of course, refer to lipid soluble uh, uh, proteins, steroids, right? Mineral O refers to what? Mm -hmm. Any idea what these do? What do you think we mean by minerals? Something about minerals. Yeah, exactly. The electrolytes. Basically, mineral corticoids help us to regulate our electrolyte levels. Oh, sodium and potassium, right? In the blood. Absolutely, like sodium and potassium. In fact, the one specific uh, mineral corticoid you're responsible for is the one that helps us to regulate it's the most common mineral corticoid because it helps us deal with the most common electrolyte. And of course, what is that most common electrolyte? Calcium. Nope, even more common than calcium. Sodium. Sodium, excellent. So what is the specific mineral corticoid that allows us to regulate calcium, uh, pardon me, regulate sodium levels? Aldosterone. Excellent, aldosterone, which plays an important role in regulating sodium levels. What do you think the target of aldosterone is? Kidney. Excellent, right, absolutely all. If we were going to regulate some type of electrolyte level, we would wanna do that in the kidney. And what is the effect going to be? What do you think it tells the kidney to do? Right, retain sodium. Of course, indirectly, if we tell the kidney to bring all this sodium back, what is also going to happen if we bring all that sodium back? Water follows. Yeah, water is going to follow. So it indirectly retains water as well. Excellent. So, of course, one more key question. How is it going to be regulated? Humorly by a sodium level in blood. Excellent. In fact, all of our mineral corticoids are going to be regulated humorally. All right, we see how the game is played. Questions on that? You guys know how much I love my stunned silences. Excellent. That means we totally get this information, Dr. Slutsky, go much faster. I get it, I'm with you kids. All right, what's our second level, our middle level, intermediate zone? Boy, or no, sorry, zone of I don't even know how to... Is it the F1 or the R1? There you go. Spell it. When all spells, spell it. Yep. Siculata. 
Zona fasciculata. Excellent. Right? That sounds a lot like the term fascicle to me. What does fascicle refer to? Bundles. Bundles of what? Cells. Yeah, we talked about bundles of muscle cells or fascicles, right? Or bundles of axons or fascicles. So this is made up of long linear um, glandular structures. Rodica, to answer your question, um, obviously these things have been studied and I'm telling you but how they are. So that's why we're going through this together. But I, hopefully some of them are intuitive, right? If something is involved in regulating the levels of sodium in the blood, then we would want to make more of it or less of it based on how much sodium was in the blood. So some of it can kind of be teased out that way. Our nervous tissue, right, is obviously going to be controlled by our nervous system. So there's hopefully some intuitive aspects of the material as we're going through it that way and you're trying to, uh, to figure out what it is. But that's why we're going through this together so that you will know what the right ways are and then you just have to memorize them. So for the most part, we have these long linear glandular structures uh, and that is the zona fasciculata. They produce a class of hormones called what? Glucocorticoids, no? Yeah, there you go. Right, these should be right on the list. So it should be a little bit intuitive. Excellent. Corticoid, as we know, refers to a steroid from the cortex of the adrenal gland, corticoid. So that's the name. And this is a glucocorticoid. So in general, what do you think they help us to do? It has something to do with glucose, absolutely. But didn't we just talk about insulin and glucagon that help us to regulate glucose levels? Yeah, so it's got to be something a little more than that. And really, what our zona fasciculata, what these glucocorticoids are involved in, is you've got the right idea. It's about mobilizing glucose and other resources, but this is specifically to deal with stress responses. Again, remember stress is that life and death situation. Those bears with axes that we have to worry about where they come in the room and we have to either fight them or we have to outrun somebody. To do that requires a massive mobilization of resources. Getting that glucose ready for us to deal with it. That's part of the problem with our stress responses. Our stress response mobilizes all these resources for us to deal with stress. The problem, the things that are uh, stressing us out is the combination of having an unhinged uh, uh, president, the fact that the air quality is like being inside of a chimney, so we're stuck inside with our families for very long periods of time and having to deal with them for long periods of time, especially when you have teenagers, it's the worst. And so you have all this stress, and how do you deal with it? Well, if you're like me, you hide in the closet and drink. And are you using a lot of resources when you're doing that? No, or maybe you as students are stressed by classes. But how do you deal with that? You sit at your computer and you write a 10 page paper, right? We mobile all these resources to deal with stress. And the problem is the things that stress us now typically aren't resolved with physical activity. As I've said many times, I was glorious before I had kids. Right? Then I had kids, mobilized all my glucose resources, I'm hiding in the closet drinking, and now I've got a belly, I've lost my hair, my eyesight's going, right? I'm falling to pieces, all because of this stress from this mobilization of things like these glucocorticoids. Now. Sounds like they're a great reason to have kids. Oh, kids are horrible. I, I highly recommend <laughs> not having them. Actually, having them is fun, but as soon as you have them, give them to somebody else. I think that's really the key. <laughs> all right. So, give me an example of a specific glucocorticoid. Cortisol. 
Excellent. Right? Which reminds me of something else. Let's talk about the targets for our uh, glucocorticoids. What are the targets for the glucocorticoids? Metabolism. Okay, part of it, but really it's more about getting the liver to metabolize, releasing that glucose. Right? This is about making resources available. So like the liver, uh, the adipose, we want to make glucose readily available in the body. So we want to be able to release those so that we can use them for energy. But what's the other big target? Right, you guys mentioned cortisol. What is cortisol also known as? Hydrocortisone. Hydrocortisone. So what's the other big target of our glucocorticoids? Immune cells. Immune cells, excellent. Right, because again, Immune cells help us with our defenses. One of the things we've talked about is how important, for instance, inflammation is in our immune response. I get injured, I swell in that area, and that tells me don't use that area. I protect that area, we congest that area. But it also can immobilize me. If I'm fighting a bear with an ax and I roll my ankle, do I want my ankle swelling up like a balloon while I'm dealing with that stress of dealing with fighting that bear with an ax? No. no. And so what happens is when we're dealing with that stress response, we actually want to suppress our immune response so that we don't get that inflammation. We don't get that, uh, you know, all those conditions associated with it so that we're able to deal with the immediate threat. It's another one of the big issues with stress, right? You're all super stressed for that exam that's happening next week. And so you're stressing and you're stressing and you're stressing and stressing. And as soon as the exam's over and that stress goes away, two days later, you're sick as a dog, All right? Because one of the things you've been doing while you're stressed is you've been suppressing your immune response. And so often right before the exam or right after the exam, everybody gets sick. Or when school ends and finals are done, right, you're sick for the week before, you're sick, sick for the week after. And that's often because the stress suppressing that immune response makes you more susceptible to those viruses. Is that why they used to give athletes cortisol shots to like reduce inflammation? Exactly, right, exactly. Hydrocortisone, you get that, hyd right? You've got that swelling in your knee, right, that's restricting your movement, the smart thing to do is to ice it, to not move it, to immobilize it, to rest it, but that doesn't allow you to get those 14 points for your fantasy football team, so what do they do instead? Inject that hydrocortisone, decrease the inflammation, and so that they can use it. Sure, there could be long-term implications of that, but as long as you win today, who cares about tomorrow, right? I got a pump Saquon full of cortisol right now. Exactly, <laughs> all right. Yeah, the Giants aren't going anywhere anyway, so it doesn't matter. Although it could be worse. You could be like me. I'm a Bengals fan. We had to get excited about a tie, so uh, it's brutal. Yeah, Broncos All right. I don't want to hear about it. Excellent. All right. So we've talked about the targets. We've talked about the function. What we haven't talked about is how do we regulate these glucocorticoids in our uh, zona fasciculata? Sounds like more by negative feedback. Well, remember, everything is, is by negative feedback. But in this case, if we have a stress response and we want to mobilize these resources, it's more neural. only there was a way that we had to, say, specifically target right, the activation of the cortex of our adrenal gland. There you go. And I will totally cheat. Adrena corticotropic hormone, I will abbreviate it. So it is regulated. So of course, what of our three regulatory processes is that? Hormonal. Hormonally, the uh, adrena corticotropic hormone. Don't abbreviate it on the exam, write it down on the exam. And of course, what releases that uh, adrena corticotropic hormone? Anterior yeah, the anterior pituitary gland. Excellent. Perfect. Questions on that? I must to know it as a posterior pituitary or adeno and neural hypotheses or just both. I'm sorry, say what? 
Do you want us to know them as anterior and posterior pituitary glands or neuro and adeno hypotheses or both? So what I would say is, as always, you are welcome to use any appropriate anatomical term. So if anterior pituitary and posterior pituitary are easier to spell, then you are welcome to do that on the exam. If I ask you for both names, should you be able to give me both book names? Absolutely. Or more importantly, if I use the term a neurohypothesis on the exam, right? And again, this is easier when it's in the classroom. You wouldn't be able to raise your hand and say, I don't know what this term means, right? It is definitely a vocabulary term and you should know what it means. So I think it's usually best to, if there's multiple names for something, to be familiar with all of them. It looks like I missed a question here. Hold on. Uh, great question. You are only responsible for the classes of hormones that are specified on your list. So again, this is a perfect example, right? Glucocorticoids, mineral corticoids are classes that are on your list, as well as the specifics of cortisol and aldosterone. Right, catecholamines and norepinephrine and epinephrine, absolutely. So typically, anytime I've given you both the classes and a specific example, you are responsible for all of that. The hormone dispensing and holding thing isn't an acceptable term? No, always be more specific. All righty. So far, so good. Here's where things get a little wonky. Our third layer is the zona reticulata. Reticularis, sorry. Reticular, where have we heard that term before? Reticulum. All right, reticular fibers, reticular connective tissues. And remember, those were those small, elaborately branched collagen fibers. And that's what we have here, a more branch-like, or even it's kind of net-like glandular structure. So it's the, the, the fibers are more interwoven with each other. So you have more kind of like a mesh or net-like overlapping uh, appearance to the layer for this zona reticularis. Now, here we produce a class of hormones. And what are the class of hormones that are produced here? Gonadocorticoids. Corticoid, cortex of the, uh, a steroid of the cortex. And gonado refers to what? Gonads. The gonads, absolutely. They produce specific Hormones and what are some of the specific hormones that could be produced here in the zona reticularis? Androgens. Androgens, which again are a class, specifically testosterone. Any others? Estrogen. Yeah, estrogens, uh, primarily estradiol. Are the specific ones there? So would that be class gonadocorticoid subclass androgen specifically yeah. testosterone? Exactly. Yes. Okay. Now, we do have one minor issue here. Is this the primary location where we make androgens and estrogens? No. Where do we primarily make androgens and estrogens? In the gonads. And here's another thing. If you have a cell up here in your bicep that a testosterone hormone comes to, does that cell in your bicep care whether it was made in the adrenal gland or whether it was made in the gonads? No, it doesn't matter where it's made. It's going to have the exact same effect. And that's one of the tricky, one of the challenging things about the zona reticularis. When we look at hormone levels in the blood, it's hard to know where they're actually made. So while these are made here, we do know that it is a relatively small amount that are produced here.
and why they're produced here in addition to in the gonads is not fully understood. It is thought that they may play a role when we think of it in terms of effects. Secondary sexual characteristics. What would secondary sexual characteristics be? Uh, axillary and pubic hair. There you go, secondary hairs like facial, axillary, anogenital, uh, thoracic, right, mammillary. Excellent secondary hairs. What else? Mammary. And enlargement of adipose in females, uh, breasts, mons pubis, hip region. Increase in muscle and, and cartilage formation in males, thickening of the bones, muscles, enlargement of the Adam's apple. All of those things that we use to tell the difference between a boy and a man, and between a girl and a woman, right? So it may play a role in helping to enhance those secondary sexual characteristics. It's also believed it may play a role in uh, things like sex drive and aggression. This is something that has been studied very, very closely in animals. Uh, one of the really interesting things that they have found in macaque uh, monkeys is macaque monkeys live in clans with multiple males in them, and the males have very distinct defined roles. There is an alpha and a beta and a gamma and a delta of the males, and they are very aware of that hierarchy and who is above them and who is below them. And you're very submissive of those above and very dominant of those below. And they, again, they have a very rigid social structure. And one of the things that they found when they've tested them is that how much uh, testosterone they have in their blood plays an important role of determining where they fall on that hierarchy. They have actually taken animals that were lower on the uh, on the, on the hierarchy and injected them with testosterone. And as a result of that, they have gained rank within their clan. So there's this very strong uh, relationship between aggression and androgens in those. And so of course, they were interested in doing something similar in humans. Now you don't get to artificially inject androgens into males and see how they affect, but one of the areas where there also tends to be a tremendous amount of aggression and a tremendous amount of rigid hierarchy is in very, very aggressive fields, like for instance, in the stock exchange. So they went to Wall Street and looked at uh, traders in the stock exchange, and they also tended to find uh, correlations in higher levels of androgens in those that were higher in the hierarchy and more aggressive in those trading types of situations. So uh, it also may be a play role in uh, sexual drive and, and aggression in females as well. So it could play a role in the, in, the, uh, in the libido of females for that rate as well. But again, it's hard to parse out this information because when we're studying the effects of these hormones on the cells, it's hard to tell where they actually came from. It's hard to distinguish these uh, gonadocorticoids from those that are actually produced by the gonads. And so when it comes to regulated, do you think we really fully understand and appreciate how these are regulated? Maybe not. No, it is likely that it is hormonal. Maybe something like the gonadotropins that are, are released by the uh, anterior pituitary, but we don't actually know. So we don't fully appreciate how this zona reticularis is actually regulated, how its hormone production is regulated. And okay. if we don't understand it, does that mean that that's going to be a question I'm going to ask on the exam? No. I found in the Google that it's uh, regulated by adrenocorticotropic hormone, but without inhibiting uh, feedback. Really? I know the zona fasciculata. You sure we're confusing it with the zona fasciculata? Because zona fasciculata is regulated by adrenocorticotropic hormone, but I wasn't aware that the zona reticularis was as well. Maybe it's wrong. It's, it's... Uh, it, it could be. I mean, like I said, one of the things I said about the field of endocrinology is there's constantly new information practically coming out on a daily basis because there's so much we don't know. 
there's a tremendous amount of uh, research going on. And again, it isn't something I've looked into recently. So you know, some, I, I wouldn't be surprised by that at all if that was indeed the case. I'm just not aware of it. And I, I won't ask that question on the exam. All right. So the target cells would be gonads? Well, so again, no. If you think of the fact that it is secondary sexual characteristics, right, then what would those target cells be? Okay. So in males, things like the muscle, things like the bones. In females, adipose production. In both, secondary hairs, right? All those things we associate with those secondary sexual characteristics, those would be the, um, the, uh, uh, the targets, and for sex drive and aggression, it would be the limbic system. All right, we have done this here all nice and pretty, but we've got all of this again here in our um, in our in our uh, illustration in our lecture. Again, notice we can really nicely see the distinct regions. Right, one region, two regions, three regions, four regions in that organization there. Notice different picture, different orientation. Where is superficial on this picture? Right top corner. Exactly, right? So what you're always gonna be looking for is that fibrous capsule. That fibrous capsule is gonna be the giveaway of what you are looking for. Uh, gonad remember, again, we don't know fully how the gonadocorticoids are regulated, so you can put an X through that one. I'm not going to ask that question on the test. Uh, but what's nice about this higher magnification view is you can see the globular portion that is the zona reticularis. You can see the more linear portion of the zona fasciculata. You can see the more mesh or web-like portion that is the zona reticularis. And then here we see the medulla down here below it this way. So again, especially when you see the entire cortex together, it is a little easier to be able to distinguish those distinct regions. Here's a pretty picture uh, from your textbook that shows both an illustration of it and then some light microscopy. Again, uh, when, it talks, when we talk about interesting choices that your uh, artists, that artists have made, when we come back here to the endocrine pictures on these charts, and let's get to, hopefully they'll show it. Here we go. So this is their picture of the adrenal gland. So if we had the chart in the classroom, what you would see is this is their representation of the adrenal gland. It doesn't show the kidney on it, but we can clearly see a medulla region here at the center, even though they've kind of squished it together, and the cortex on the outside. But the other thing that I want you to look closely at, and this is one of the reasons why I really emphasize orienting yourselves on these pictures, is because if you look closely, they have put a little rectangle right on the picture right here. And that rectangle that they've cut out represents the magnified view of the adrenal cortex, of the adrenal gland they're going to give you. And so lo and behold, when we look at this elongated picture, because of where they took that, you will notice that here, the fibrous capsule is on the bottom. So this is superficial and this is deep. Here up here is the medulla. Here is the zona reticularis, the zona fasciculata, and the, glomeri and the zona glomerulosa. So again, don't just think a lot of the textbooks, and that's really why I want to emphasize this, a lot of the textbooks always show superficial up and deep down. But when you look at this histologically, when you look at other ways, you're not going to see that. All right, so again, find that fibrous capsule, and then it doesn't matter how I orient this picture, you will be able to distinguish the distinct regions. Is it the zona? Glomerulosa or the glomerulus? Glomerulosa. Glomerulus is that specialized caps, uh, capillary that we found in the kidney. So as you can see, zona, oh, here, let's change color. 
zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, zona reticularis. Okay, it just has it different on our uh, chart. On the chart or on uh, the handle? On, uh, on the histology list, it says glomerulus. Yeah, and then it says zona fasciculata and zona reticularis. They're like all three together. Well, you are responsible for all three of them. I apologize if there's a type and error on that. But yeah, you need to distinguish the three regions histologically. Okay, yeah. I was just, yeah, I got it. Okay. All righty. So again, the cortex produces, the whole cortex produces lipid-based hormones that collectively are known as the corticosteroids. This is the first gland that we've looked at so far that produces steroid-based hormones. And as we mentioned, there are three distinct regions, the zona glomerulosa, which produces the class called mineral corticoids, the zona fasciculata that produces the glucocorticoids, and the zona reticularis that produces the gonadocorticoids. I will not show the distinct regions to you this way. On the exam, I will always use a picture like this one, or a picture like this one, or even that low magnification one, where you can see all three regions and distinguish them. So I'm not just out of the blue gonna show you some picture like this. I don't think this by itself is necessarily intuitive as to what it is. But since you know we are clearly talking about the cortex of the adrenal gland, you can see very clearly that these are kind of globular or ball-shaped secretory structures. So only in context are we looking at, it th at this high magnification view. When we look at the uh, cortex of the adrenal gland, I will always show you the entire cortex so that you can distinguish the regions that way. As we talked about, it produces a class of hormones called mineral corticoids, mainly aldosterone targets the kidney, and regulates our electrolyte balance. And like we said, aldosterone retains sodium, retains water, and also plays a, a minimal role in releasing potassium. And of course, how did we say it was regulated? Are all our mineral corticoids regulated? Hello? Adrena corticotropic? Nope. Mineral corticoids are regulated. They regulate our electrolytes. So how are we going to? There. Humorally. humorally. Uh, and again, yep. you get partial credit for sodium, but I want humorally via sodium. Here we have our zona fasciculata, more linear glandular structures, and again, not going to hold you responsible for an up-close view of this, but since we're in context knowing what we talk about, we can see that linear orientation to the glandular cells. They produce our glucocorticoids, primarily cortisol, but cortisol, as we also mentioned, is also known as hydrocortisone, which targets our liver, targets our adipose, targets our immune cells. And like we said, it is going to mobilize our resources to deal with stress and suppress our immune response to deal with that stress. Because if you're in a life or death situation, you don't want to have a runny nose. If you're in a life or death situation, you don't want your ankle swelling up like a balloon. Right? Yeah, they're running on your ankle may cause problems, but that bear with an ax is going to cause a lot more. So we deal with that stress by suppressing our immune response because it's supposed to be a life or death situation. Believe it or not, 10 page papers are not life and death situations. I know it feels that way, but they are not. And how is our zona fasciculata and our glucocorticoid production regulated? Hormonally via adrenocorticotropic. Excellent, I like how Ashley was ready. She was poised and ready to go, knew the question was coming, I love it. <laughs> Excellent, perfect. Lastly, we have the zona reticularis, again, more of a mesh-like, not it's linear, but it's not globular, so it's kind of overlapping mesh-like in its appearance. 
produces those androgens and some estrogens, but only a small amount. Again, associated with those secondary sexual characteristics, aggression and sex drive. And we don't really have to worry about how it's regulated. We don't really fully understand how it's regulated. We're not gonna worry about how it's regulated. So we can put a nice big X through that part for the gonadocorticoids. All right. Excellent. Questions on that? Perfect. We are done with our cortex, but we are not done with our adrenal gland. We still have that chewing nougat center, the adrenal medulla. Notice as I look at the adrenal medulla, here it's just kind of uniform cells. And what do you think the name of this kind of uniform mesh of cells? Do we have a name for these particular cells found in the adrenal medulla? Well, I'm asking the question, so clearly we do. So oh cheat and look at your histology list and tell me what you call these cells found in the adrenal medulla. Chromaffin cells. Chromaffin cells, excellent. These are the chromaffin cells. They produce amino acid-based hormones, a class of which are the catecholamines. About 70 to 80% epinephrine and the rest is norepinephrine. And like we said, it is that short-term stress response. So heart muscle, arterial muscle, liver, adipose, bronchioles, you know, the, the smooth muscle of the eye for dilating the eye, all those things that we talked about back in 430 associated with that fight or flight stress response. And how was this one regulated? Neurally by a sympathetic nervous system. Excellent, this one is regulated neurally by the sympathetic nervous system. Excellent. And that is the adrenal gland. Take a quick peek at something. Questions on that? Excellent, we are doing great on time. So again, teeny bit early. But that was a lot of material, dense material. We've made it through the adrenal gland. It's all downhill from here. Although again, when we get to the gonads, there's a little bit more vocabulary. And, and again, it'll be things we talk more about when we get to our reproductive system. But I think this is a good natural stopping point. So let's go ahead and take our second break here. Uh, so we'll, again, we'll take another 15 minute break and it is at uh, 2.07, so that means coming back at 2.22. That's a good number. Twenty-two, and we will start the recording at that point. All right, any questions before we take our next break? All right, I'll see you back here in 15 minutes. All righty. We are in the home stretch. So any questions before we get started? All righty then, let's move on to the gonads. Uh, starting first with the ovary. Uh, the ovary is similar to the uh, adrenal gland in that it has an outer region that is a cortex and the inner region that is a medulla. However, it is very different in that it does not have a distinct border the same way. We could get very clearly see where the dividing point was, where the cells changed in their composition from the medulla to the cortex in the adrenal gland, and that is not the case with the ovary. Uh, the main way we can distinguish them is the medulla is the area in the center where there's primarily the blood vessels and the nerves and things along those lines. Whereas out here in the cortex is where we have uh, structures that are known as the ovarian follicles. And these ovarian follicles are where the eggs are matured. We will talk about them and the stage of, the, of them in great detail when we get to the reproductive system. But for our purposes here, we are gonna focus primarily on what is known as a mature follicle, or what is also known as a graphene or tertiary follicle. 
The primary way we can identify this is by this big, large, fluid-filled space. This big, large, fluid-filled space is what is known as the antrum. And that's too big, so let's decrease the size of that. That is the easiest way to identify this. And then we have a very large cell here. This very large cell is the still immature egg. Now, of course, egg is the common term. The appropriate term for a mature egg is an ovum. Uh, but this one is an immature one. So this is known as an oocyte. So this big, large cell that is here located inside of the ovarian follicle is what is known as an oocyte. And this oocyte is surrounded, and here I'm going to color them. Uh, we'll use green. By all these tightly packed cells. Notice some of these tightly packed cells are directly around the oocyte. And the rest of these tightly packed cells, oops, hold on, can't have that. The rest of these tightly packed cells form the structure of the follicle that contains the antrum. All of these cells that we've just drawn in green there, and so maybe we should use the green color for the label, are what are known as the granulosa cells. All right. And we can even draw, oh, that was horrible. Um, let's do it this way. I'll cheat. Do, 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 do. Do, do, do. Do, do, do. There we go. Granulosa cells. Bingo. Uh, actually, let's make that green one. Bingo. And notice there is a cluster of cells on the outer surface of this as well. This particular one doesn't show it quite as well, but we can still distinguish it uh, definitely here. There is a densely packed layer of cells on the outer surface of the follicle. And these cells on the outer surface of the follicle are what are known as fecal cells. Perfect. Now, obviously our goal here is twofold. We want in this follicle to mature the oocyte, be able to release it of the uh, ovaltine, and then ultimately get pregnant, right? And as we also know, the goal of the ovary is to produce hormones. So of course, it does not take any, uh, you know, hard or challenging guesses to say, of course, what class of hormones are produced by our fecal cells. Since we are in the ovaries, okay. what hormone? My microphone is on, right? Yes. What class of hormones is going to be produced by the fecal cells? Estrogen. All right, we're in the ovaries, right? So it should be a super simple, easy answer. Of course, what class of hormones are produced by fecal cells? Absolutely, androgens. Wait, what? No, estrogens. Estrogens. Progesterone. Well, but I've already written androgens. I really don't have to erase it. So I won't. Because I don't have to. Because fecal cells actually produce androgens. I know it doesn't sound intuitive, but what actually happens is our fecal cells produce androgens. That is what the fecal cells do. They produce the androgens. Then what happens is the granulosa cells take the androgens and their job is to convert androgens into the estrogens. 
So you guys are absolutely correct in that our goal of our ovaries is to produce the class of hormones that we think of as estrogens. But it turns out they don't just do it out of thin air. What happens is this outer layer of cells, these thecal cells actually produce androgens, and then it is the granulosa cells that convert it into estrogens. Again, it is thought that these particular androgens that are produced here, and let me cheat again and give myself a little bit more space to write, uh, may play a role in sex drive and aggression, similar to what we were talking about with those gonadocorticoids uh, that are produced in the zona reticularis. So again, as we see, women do need some androgens uh, in there, but obviously the primary goal is to produce estrogens, and so that is what our granulosa cells actually do. I have a question. I'm sorry? I have a question. I have an answer. I'm looking on the histology list and it doesn't say, um, doesn't mention any entry, antrium, but it says about corpus luteum or about ovaries. Hold on, I, have, let me, I, have, I haven't looked at it in a while. Let me take a peek. So, of course, the short answer to what uh, I would say to you is that we're talking about it in lecture. So remember, regardless of where we talk about something, lecture or lab, you are definitely responsible for it on, uh, in the exam. But let's actually look at the list and see what we have there to make sure there isn't any confusion. So granulosa cells, fecal cells, oocyte, we have definitely those. Well, we haven't talked about the corpus luteum yet. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, so uh, you're correct. Antrim isn't, in, since it's not on the list, that would be okay if you don't have that for this. Uh, again, I, I may not ask you for that space on this test. You'll definitely get it when we get to the reproductive system. But what I would say is that antrim does help us to recognize um, that this is an ovarian follicle. So that would be the one thing that I would say to that is that it can help you to recognize that. So while it may not be something you're gonna be tested on, it is an identifying feature that can help you to recognize it. All right? Now, as I mentioned, this structure eventually is going to rupture at, ov at ovulation. And what happens is something really interesting. When ovulation occurs, the egg and these cells that surround it are released. This ruptures and they disperse. It is released into the interstitial fluid uh, of, the, well, of the peritoneal cavity and then hopefully gets into the uterine tubes. But notice there's all these granulosa cells left behind. And does anybody remember what hormone we said triggers ovulation? One of the hormones from the anterior pituitary gland, we said triggers ovulation. Do you remember which one we said it was? There we go, luteinizing hormone. Luteinizing hormone is, does two things. It triggers ovulation, and then as the name indicates, it luteinizes. What it means to luteinize is it causes a transformation to take place in these granulosa cells. And these granulosa cells become this big, massive glandular structure known as the corpus luteum. So here, we'll come back to all this in a second. Let's go on that with the picture. So here we have a mature follicle when this mature follicle ruptures, and that's what we have here. This structure here is what's left at first when the follicle ruptures. And it kind of looks like a pop balloon because we have these leftover granulosa cells that are left behind. 
but that luteinizing hormone causes uh, these glandular cells to become this big, huge, massive gland. In fact, as you can see here, this whole big thing right here is that corpus luteum. This whole big massive glandular thing was formed by that one follicle after expulsion of the egg. All right. Now, our corpus luteum occurs after ovulation. So after ovulation, as I mentioned, the egg has been released and could be fertilized. And so its job is to tell the body to get ready. So while the corpus luteum also produces estrogens, it also produces another class of hormones. The class of hormones that warms the, warns the female body that it could get pregnant any second now and it's gotta get ready to be pregnant. And what is that class of hormones? Gonadotropins? No. Progest no, be careful, not progesterone. Progesterone is the specific one, progestins. So estrogens and progestins are the two main classes of hormones uh, that are produced. But you're right, progesterone is the most common progestin. Estradiol is the most common estrogen. So that's the biggest difference between this corpus luteum and the follicle. The granulosa cells of the follicle just produce estrogens. This corpus luteum produces estrogens and progestins. All right, so now that we've looked at the histology, let's go back. Again, estrogens are produced by the follicular cells of the ovary, the ones that form that follicle, and again, specifically the granulosa cells. So those granulosa cells that form the follicle. And what are the targets of estrogen? Uterus. Well, okay, absolutely, uterus is one of it. What else? Ovaries. All right, the ovaries itself. In particular, in the ovaries, the oocyte. Right, it's gonna cause the maturation of the oocyte, get that oocyte to grow. Mammary glands, excellent. Right. Adipose formation, things along those lines, right? Estrogens, especially estradiol, right? Attack, attack, they don't attack, they, they affect and influence uh, the ovaries, the uterus, the mammary glands. They're the feminizing hormone. They mature the oocyte, they mature the mammary glands. They get the uterus starting to regrow after uh, menstruation, right? the recovery from menstruation, and the 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 you know the maturation of the female's body. Specifically, the follicle prior to ovulation. Right, those granulosa cells. What? regulates the activity of the follicular cells? It is indeed hormonally, but remember luteinizing hormone is what makes the corpus luteum. In this case, we need a hormone to influence our follicular cells. There you go. Hormonally via the follicle stimulating hormone. It's in the name. Follicle stimulating hormone stimulates the follicle of the ovary. Stimulates those granulosa cells to produce estrogens. Perfect. Whereas we know progestins, specifically progesterone, are produced by that corpus luteum. Its primary targets are to get the female's body ready for pregnancy, right? Mammary glands, but also the uterus as well. This is when we get the massive growth, massive glandularization, massive vascularization of the uterus because progestins are basically the warning bell that the female's body gives off that says, hey, 
We could be getting pregnant any second now. Get ready. Because while that egg is only viable for about 24 hours after it is released, so if it's going to be fertilized, it's going to be fertilized within the first 24 hours. It can take over a week before it finally gets to the uterus and gets implanted. So the female's body has time to get ready in anticipation. Now, of course, if that egg isn't fertilized, the corpus luteum goes away, the progestins go away, and what happens for the female? Menstrual cycle. Yeah, menstruation occurs and the whole process begins all over again. And again, we'll describe that process in detail when we get to the reproductive system. But absolutely, this is the one, promotes gestation, maintains the pregnancy, gets, uh, matures, plays a role along with human somatomammotropin in preparing the mammary glands for lactation, gets the body ready. And absolutely, you've got it. Progestin levels, because they're produced by the corpus luteum, and the corpus luteum is produced by the luteinizing hormone. It is, horm it is regulated hormonally via luteinizing hormone. All righty, questions on that? As you will see, this is just the tip of the iceberg. When we get to the reproductive system, right, both males and females have reproductive systems, but that doesn't mean much. Because both a 1968 Volkswagen Bug and a 2021 Lexus both have engines. However, if you'd never seen an engine before, would you want to study both of those because they're easily both the same? If you were trying to understand how an engine works, would you want to start with that 2021 Lexus or the 1968 Volkswagen Bug? The they both have engines, but this one is a whole heck of a lot simpler. Well, that is exactly what the reproductive system is going to be like. In the reproductive systems, men are the bugs, females are the Lexus. Lexuses, Lexi, I don't know, whatever the plural of Lexus is, right? Uh, far, far more complicated, so, whereas uh, boys are pretty simple. So this is just scratching the tip of the iceberg when we get to that. And it'll be fun when we get to the reproductive system. All righty. Speaking of boys, well, I'm actually like speaking of girls still, those are the two primary hormones that we talk about, or classes of hormones that we talk about. But there are some other hormones that are produced both by the ovaries to help to regulate the process, but even more importantly, by the placenta when the female is pregnant. When the female is pregnant after week 10 or so, uh, nine or 10 is when the placenta becomes fully functional and it starts producing the hormones. That's actually when the baby switches uh, from being an embryo to being a fetus, is basically by the development of the placenta. And so the placenta is gonna be responsible for producing the hormones. Now, of course, the placenta also produces estrogens, also produces progestins, and again, when we think of the targets in the body, does the mammary gland care where that estrogen came from? No, it's gonna affect it the same. But there are some other hormones we wanna talk about as well. Inhibin is an important hormone that actually targets the hypothalamus in the pituitary gland. It is those gonadotropins that control how fast we mature the uh, Egg, for instance, follicle stimulating hormone is what matures the egg. Right. It's a big elaborate process that on average takes about 28 days. But if you think about it as a female, that means you only have one chance a month to get pregnant. Wouldn't it be way more fun if you ovulated four times a month, once a week, just to get, increase the likelihood of propagating the species? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Maybe not fun from a lifestyle standpoint, but from a biological standpoint, that might make a little bit of sense. But obviously, we don't want that to be the case. So we need to control this process. Faster isn't always better. And that's what inhibin is about. Inhibin actually responds to, and this is what's really interesting, inhibin is produced based on a uh, Follicle stimulating hormone levels. 
What this means is that the more follicle stimulating hormone in the blood, the more inhibin that is produced. Because what happens is follicle stimulating hormone stimulates the ovary to mature the egg. But if the eggs are maturing too quickly, that's a problem. And so the more follicle stimulating hormone in the blood, the more the ovary produces inhibin, sending that inhibin back to the uh, pituitary gland and telling the pituitary gland to stop making, it tells it to stop making and stop releasing follicle stimulating hormone. This is an interesting control process because what inhibin is doing, the follicle stimulating hormone isn't stimulating the ovaries to produce inhibin. What happens is the ovaries are counting how much follicle stimulating hormone is in the blood. And depending on how much is in the blood, it tells the, uh, the, the ovary how much inhibin to make. So when we think of this in terms of a regulatory process, what kind of regulation is this actually? Humoral. Exactly, absolutely, it is humoral. Remember, humoral is about counting how much of something there is in the blood. And that's what's happening here. This is actually a humoral control, but what makes this interesting is what is it actually counting in the blood? Hormones. Right, and in particular, follicle stimulating hormone. So this is actually humoral control. And again, I, you don't have to write counting on the exam. I'm gonna write it there as a reminder to us while we discuss it. But this is actually a humoral control where it's counting how much follicle stimulating hormone is in the blood. All right. So Questions we can just say via levels of FS or follicle stimulating hormone in blood. Yeah, exactly. And again, you can really just say humorally via follicle stimulating hormone, right? Okay. The same way you said humorally via calcium or humorally via glucose or humorally via sodium, humorally via follicle stimulating hormone. Nope, it's not. No, it's not the estrogen. It's actually the control hormone that it's counting. Because the more estrogen it makes, the faster the egg matures. All right, we did that. Here's an interesting one. Human chorionic gonadotropin. We've been talking about hormones that men make and women make. Do males make human chorionic gonadotropin? No. Do women make human chorionic gonadotropin? Yes, or no, maybe you do. Well, I like the confusion on that answer because you're absolutely correct. Technically, is it a cell of the female's body that produces human chorionic gonadotropin? Yes, yes. No. Oh. They are cells inside of the female's body, but the cells aren't actually technically hers because human chorionic gonadotropin is made by a zygote. What is a zygote? Right, it's a fertilized egg. And you're right, that fertilized egg, when it's one cell that's been fertilized by the sperm, it becomes a zygote. That divides to become two cells, those two become four, and we get the development of more of an embryo before fetus. So we've got that embryo, but it's not an R that embryo that is forming. And so it is those embryonic cells that produce human chorionic gonadotropin. Remember we talked about this cycle. The female ovulates because there's a massive spike of luteinizing hormone. And that massive spike of luteinizing hormone not only causes ovaltine to occur, but it also causes the leftover granulosa cells to become the corpus luteum. But then luteinizing hormone cells go away. And as the amount of luteinizing hormone goes away, the corpus luteum goes away. 
and as it goes away, you produce less progesterone, you produce less estrogen, and menses occurs. What's cool about human chorionic gonadotropin is human chorionic gonadotropin stimulates the corpus luteum directly. So you maintain a big full corpus luteum and you keep high levels of estrogen and high levels of progesterone. So it actually targets the ovary, uh, specifically uh, targeting the corpus luteum uh, to maintain that corpus luteum. And it helps to maintain the uterus as well because we are gonna have high levels of progestins. Those high levels of progestins are what tell the uterus to stay ready, stay prepared for pregnancy, right? Again, as we've learned these things, we've become very sophisticated with it. But very early on when we learned this, one of the things we learned is that if you have, have high levels of progestins in your blood, not only does it help to maintain the uterus, but is the uterus going to start, uh, pardon me, is the ovary going to start making new eggs, maturing new eggs to get ready to get pregnant if it's already pregnant and has high levels of progestin? No. No. So one of the things they thought is, hey, if we give females these pills that they can pop where they elevate their levels of progestin, then that'll trick their ovaries into not maturing eggs, no mature eggs, no ovulation, right? And what do they call that type of medicine? Birth control. Birth control, absolutely. In fact, the original birth controls were progestin pills. You had three weeks of progestin pills that you had to take. You take them once a day for three weeks, tricking your body into thinking that uh, you were pregnant, wouldn't mature the egg, then you'd stop for a week. That would allow the levels to drop and menses would occur because we believe menses was still required every month. And then you would start taking it again. Of course, people lose track of time, so then you'd get three weeks of pills, and then what else would you get along with that? Sugar pills? Yeah, fourth week of sugar pills, just as a placeholder to get you through the month, absolutely. Right, just as a placeholder. So yeah, the, the original birth control pills were basically just these progestin levels to, again, maintain that. And that's what human chorionic gonadotropin does. Human chorionic gonadotropin maintains the corpus luteum, maintains high levels of progestin, and that is what maintains the pregnancy. What's also interesting about this is, again, there's only one thing that makes human chorionic gonadotropin. So if there is a way to, say, test the blood, or if the levels of it got so high that maybe the kidney expressed some of it, so we could test the urine, if we were able to test the blood or urine for human chorionic gonadotropin, we might be able to know if a woman was carrying a growing zygote inside of them. Do those things exist? Yes. Yeah. What are they? Pregnancy. Yeah. Exactly. You pee on the stick. That's what the stick is looking for. It's looking for the presence of human chorionic gonadotropin. I'm not sure that that would fall under the fun category, but uh, yeah, I could see that. Well, that would that would definitely be the case for a while. All right, excellent. One last one, relaxin. Relaxin is a hormone that is produced by the placenta and uh, it doubles, interesting. Um, what relaxin does is help to basically prepare the female's body for pregnancy and birth. Again, females have this issue of needing to be able to contain a basketball within their body and then pass that basketball through their pelvis. So relaxin is one of those things that helps to loosen the ligaments, allow for more expansion of the belly and more accommodation of the organs. Uh, one of the interesting things is relaxin does this uh, very well of relaxing these things. And so often when a female is pregnant a second time, less relaxin is necessary to loosen those things. So often it appears as if a woman is showing more for a second pregnancy than they did for the first. It isn't that the baby's developing faster, it's that their body is accommodating more rapidly uh, because of that memory from it. The other distinctive thing that relaxin does is if you remember way back in 430, we talked about how the pubic symphysis of the pelvis is that joint made up of fibrocartilage 
and relax and loosens that fibrocartilage, making it more flexible in the pelvis, making it easier to pass the basketball. And as we talked about in 430, as we said, pregnant females, especially late term pregnant fe females, tend to get a very distinctive gait because of the loosening of that pubic symphysis. And notice again, I did not use the term waddle. All right, questions on that? What are they regulated by? So again, this is, we're not gonna worry about how this is regulated. Again, this is something that is being produced by the embryo. Uh, the embryonic cells are the ones that are making this and releasing this. So we're more concerned about what the effects of it are as, and we're not so much worried about how it's gonna be regulated because how it's gonna be regulated is far more complicated. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we get to, um, oh, good question, no. Uh, would, would, uh, when we get to the reproductive system. Again, it's not my area of expertise. I am not aware of any increases in miscarriages due to an increase in relaxin. Uh, what is more common is the drop in uh, progestin levels. So if human chorionic gonadotropin levels are lower and progestin levels are lower, uh, that can increase the likelihood of miscarriages. Uh, one of the things that happens with uh, couples that are able to um, fertilize the egg, but can't maintain the pregnancy, often have lower levels of progestins. And so often by taking progestin supplements after fertilization has occurred, uh, then it makes it easier for them to maintain the baby. I've heard that as well, that they're often uh, late and the second babies are often early. I don't, I think, I, my concern is that that's more anecdotal than, abs, than actual truth. Uh, but uh, what I, so I, I can't speak to the reliability of that, but I will definitely say that a female's body adjusts to being pregnant faster, uh, subsequent pregnancies than it does the first time. So, all righty. Excellent. From the Lexus to the Volkswagen, here we have a testis. Unlike the female who is born with all of the gametes she is ever going to need and more, males uh, from the time of puberty to the time they die are constantly producing them. And that's what we have here. Here we have the spermatozoa making factory. Uh, again, a half mile. Exactly. It is an exhausting task. We shouldn't be required to do anything else. Right? Here, rolled up inside of this testis is a half mile of tubing whose job is to make all of those gametes. Here, we look at it in an up-close view, and we see a cross-section through this tube, and this tube for sperm production is what is known as the seminiferous tubules. Here, we start from stem cells at the basal surface of this tube, and then they mature and develop towards the lumen, where in the lumen we get our sperm-shaped cells that are then moved out of this and matured and everything else that goes along. Like I said, we'll talk about that in great detail when we get to the reproductive system. What we want to focus on right now are instead these cells located here outside of the tubules. These cells outside of the tubules are where the males make their hormones. Those cells outside of the tubules, exactly, are what are known as the interstitial cells or the interstitial cells of Leydig, because good old Bob Leydig planted his flag in it. These interstitial cells are what produce our class of hormones known as the androgens, and by far the most common androgen is testosterone. And what are the targets of those androgens? Testes. <clears throat> Say again? Testes. True, testes, skeletal muscle hair, although we want to be careful with the testes as well, because one of the keys to uh, androgens, uh, for the testes in particular, is not the formation of sperm, but instead the maturation. Spermatozoa 
we can produce, a man can still produce a half billion uh, sperm during the course of the day, even if he has zero androgens in his body. However, what he's not able to do is mature them. And by mature them, what I mean is make them sexually viable, make them actually capable of fertilizing an egg. All right? So again, it is vitally important for the maturation of the sperm, not sperm production. And then like we talked about all those secondary sexual characteristics like the uh, facial hair, like the loss of hair on the top of your head, uh, like uh, increase in muscle mass, bones, so on and so forth. All those uh, male sexual characteristics, aggression, you know, libido, all those things we talked about and sperm formation. And how are androgen production, how is androgen production regulated? Hormonally via gonadocorticoids? True, uh, so you are correct, but we'd want to be more specific because do both gonadocorticoids or, or uh, do both of those affect them equally? Is it follicle stimulating hormone? Remember I told you the trick. The same one that does progesterone does testosterone. Luminizing? So the same hormone that promotes the production of progesterone promotes the production of testosterone. So it is regulated hormonally by Luteinizing hormone. Luteinizing hormone. Excellent. Hormonally by luteinizing hormone. Perfect. All righty. Questions on that? May we tune to the ovaries for a second? Um, uh, to the um, this uh, list that we have uh, on list of ho hormones. Oh, you mean the handout? Yes, it says, um, I'm a little bit confused about progestins and progestogens. Because on the list it says progesto progestogens, but you didn't mention them. You just mentioned progestins. Oh, I'm sorry, it's just a, a typo. Progestins, progestins are the class, progesterone is the specific one. So it's just, I get one letter just like you guys. Progestin. Okay, okay thank you. I just was confused about yeah. it. Actually, I guess that's more than one letter. Progestins, yeah, are the class, and then progesterone is the, so yeah, that's a, just a typo. I did it twice. Yep, so it's just a typo. Thank you for catching that. All righty. Oh, notice, this, even though a male is producing a half billion sperm during the course of the day, we still need to regulate the control of it. So once again, just like females, the target of inhibin is going to be the anterior pituitary. Right? The effect is to reduce the production and release of our uh, follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, right? the gonadotropins. And again, it is going to be the levels of that follicle stimulating hormone that cause it. So it's also going to be regulated humorally by follicle stimulating hormone. Again, we don't want these processes going too fast. We don't want these processes going too slow in both males and females. And like I said, we'll talk about this regulation in much more detail when we get to the reproductive system. Decrease the production of the gonadotropins, luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. All righty, those are most of the big organs, but we still have some other organs and some other cells and glands that we need to talk about. Uh, to, uh, but I think that's it for the histology. I don't think there's any more histology you are responsible for for this part. Uh, let's talk about one we've already discussed, our thymus. 
our thymus gland produces the hormone thymosin. And what's special about thymosin compared to all the other hormones we have talked about? It's responsible for T cells, for reproduction of T cells. True. And where are those T cell mature? So the target is indeed the T cells for maturation. The thymus? They're in the thymus. So if you think about it, the thymosin is the one hormone we've talked about that really, I mean, technically it's a circulating hormone that goes into the circulation, but what it affects is itself. So really it's kind of an autocrine hormone. It is regulating the activity of itself. So absolutely, that target is those T cells, the thymus tissue itself for that maturation of our T cells. And regulated by? Well, that was what I was gonna ask you. How do you think it's regulated? Anyone want to hazard a guess? The humorally the thyroid stimulating or no, never mind. <laughs> Not a bad guess. You're getting close. It is going to be humorally. But what do you think we would be looking for in the humors of the body that would tell us whether we need to mature more T cells or not? T cell levels, excellent. Now, this is a little bit of a cheat because what actually happens is T cells release certain cytokines and those cytokines would tell the thymus to make more or less, but the more T cells, the more of that chemical, the less T cells we need, right? The fewer T cells, the less of that chemical, the more that we need. So really, it's a teeny bit of a cheat, but I like it, so let's stick with it. Humorally by T cell levels, because that's really what we're looking at. We're looking at the number of T cells we have in the blood, and that is gonna determine. It's a little bit more tricky than that, but I like that, let's stick with that. But the uh, high amount of the T cells in the blood, that's about the uh, inflammation or about the, um, the problem in the body, right? True, but at the same time, if we already have a large number of T cells, does that mean our thymus needs to be making more at that point? No, what we're doing is mobilizing the ones that are available. When, like I said, I, 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 this is truly a sky is blue answer. It is far more complicated than this, okay. but it's a good basic simple way of describing it. So for our purposes, I think it meets our needs. Again, we could spend a whole semester talking just about our immune response. So all of these things are far more complicated than we're getting the chance to talk about. So we have to simplify things a little bit. And this is one of those simplifications. Let's talk about our next gland, the pineal gland, also known as your first chakra, also known as your third eye. Pineal gland produces a hormone, melatonin. Oh, I know that one. That's the one that makes your skin dark, right? Oh. Makes you sleep. <clears throat> ah, that's right. Melatonin is not the thing that makes your skin dark. What makes your skin dark again? Melanin. Melanin, excellent. So you've got the right idea. Melatonin plays a role in our sleep-wake cycle. Well, let's say it this way, regulates It helps to, uh, to regulate our sleep-wake cycle. It can be somewhat relaxing, but really more making you sleepy. And again, we know things like this because uh, back in ancient times, and by ancient times, I mean the 60s and 70s, uh, what happens is when you turned 18 and graduated high school, you did one of two things. You either went into the army or you went to a four-year university. And if you went to a four-year university, uh, what happened was your first year, you were required to go to a psychology class. And that psychology class was pretty much just an excuse for people to torture you. We have heard many classic examples. Probably one of the greatest one is that prisoner's dilemma that happened at Stanford that became a whole huge big thing that they talk about in psychology and everything else. But they were interested in studying how people work. 
right? How many people this morning got up because they wanted to get up? Just got up on their own, you know, stretched, smiled, and scratched yourself and got out of bed just because, right? Anybody get out of bed this morning just because? <laughs> Your child may have, absolutely. But most of us got up because an alarm clock went off or because our kids yelled or something like that. Most of us eat lunch not when we're hungry, but when it fits into our schedule, right? And things along those lines. We are driven by societal pressures. The problem is birds don't have these societal pressures, and yet they seem to know when to get up, when to eat, when to go to bed, when to fly south for the winter. So what they were interested in is wondering is if we were able to remove all these social pressures, what would happen? So they took a bunch of freshmen and they locked them each into their own individual rooms in a basement where you had no uh, clock, you had no window, you had no TV, so no way of keeping track of time. They had light switch, they had foods, they had uh, you know, books and things along those lines. And what they found is exactly as, as Ryan pointed out, after a few days of this, people would actually get on a fairly rhythmic cycle where they would wake up at about the same time every morning, eat at about the same time during the day, and go to sleep at the same time of night. Without those social cues, without those external cues, people got on a cycle. So there must be something internal that did that. And that internal thing inside of us that does that is indeed melatonin. Now, hopefully you haven't been locked in the basement for a week, but many of us have experienced the effects of melatonin. Because what happens is you hop on a plane and you fly over to London for the weekend and you get off the plane, right? And it's lunchtime and you're ready to go shop and you're ready to do things and everybody else is going to bed and getting ready to go sleep at night. What do we call that condition? Jet lag. Jet lag, exactly. Jet lag is caused by that disruption in your cycle compared to what's going on in the environment around you. And it's due to melatonin. All right, so melatonin levels build up typically during the course of the day, making us more tired. And when we sleep, that melatonin is broken down. All right, as someone mentioned earlier, we take advantage of that by taking a melatonin tablet. You have trouble sleeping, just pop a melatonin pill. That spikes your levels and you sleep, all right, like a kitten. I don't know if kittens sleep, I don't know, whatever. I couldn't think of baby, I guess. Babies, although babies wake up every two hours crying, so I've never understood that one either. You sleep really good, right? But here's the problem. As we've talked about, what's the primary way you regulate hormones in your body? Negative feedback. Negative feedback. So if you take a pill that spikes your melatonin levels, your pineal gland goes, oh crap, we have way too much melatonin. And what does it do? It slams down on production. So then night comes around and you have super low melatonin levels and are you ready to sleep? No, so you have to pop another pill and then it slams it down anymore and it keeps suppressing your ability so that when you stop taking those pills, you have an even harder time sleeping than you did before. Absolutely, it can be a major issue with dependency on those pills because you're building up this vicious cycle that ruins your production. So what do you do instead? Instead, when you get to London and pop in a melatonin pill, how can you do that? Yes, don't give kids melatonin gummies. Do they really have those? Yeah. That is terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> That's so, that is so ridiculous. Why would you even bother with that when it's so much easier to give kids Benadryl and just knock them out with that? <laughs> The $8 babysitter. All right, I'm kidding, mostly. All right, excellent. So the point is, remember what I said about the pineal gland is the pineal gland is your first chakra, but it's also your third eye. One of the interesting things that they have found is that there are actually direct connections from your retina to your pineal gland. So when you get to London for the weekend, as I'm sure you're all planning on doing this weekend, is going into London for the weekend, what you do when you get to your destination is the first morning you were there, get up at sunrise, sit out on the porch, and take in about an hour of sunlight. And that hour of sunlight that you take in will actually help you to reset your pineal gland and will dramatically reduce the jet lag symptoms that you get from travel. All right? Questions on that? Also, people have trouble sleeping. Uh, too, too light in the room? 
can affect melatonin levels. Uh, again, this is one of the things that you see with kids. Kids used to have night lights that you would just turn on, you know, plug it into the light socket and have it on all the time. And one of the things that they found is the more ambient light in a room, the harder it is to get deep, restful sleep. So most of the night lights now are things that you turn on, they're on for 20 minutes and then the light goes out so that you can lower that level and get more of that deep restful sleep to be able to reset that. Your pineal gland should be on your list. It's on the, it's on the front. No, at the top? Yeah. Oh, there you go, pineal gland, there you go. Thyroid gland. Oh yeah. So yeah. So it was after the thyroid, after, uh, before the thyroid gland. So I guess I'm not going entirely in order. But yep, it's there. Okay. Uh, so then the question because, and I think I hopefully gave it away. How is the pineal gland regulated? Oh well, what's the target? We know it's producing that melatonin, but what does that melatonin actually affect? Anybody know? Now the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary. Remember our hypothalamus we talked about regulates many of our basic functions, including our sleep-wake cycle. Fact is that sleep-wake cycle. And Alex is absolutely right. It is regulated via the eyes. So how would that be then? Regulated, which of our three methods of regulation would that be? Neural. Neural via vision or the eyes. I would be fine with the eyes. So neural via the eyes, neural via vision. All righty. Great question. Jessica just asked, what about blind people? That is actually one of the major problems uh, for some blind people. Some people, oh God, what is it called? Some people have uh, a reversal of their sleep-wake cycle where they're more alert during the night and asleep during the day. I forget what they call that condition, but you're absolutely, I'm <laughs> not being a vampire, uh, but, you, uh, but you're right. Uh, it, Having a regular sleep-wake cycle can be a problem for many blind people, especially those that have been blind since birth. So yeah, there is there is a technical term for that. No, it's not vampires or night owls, although those are great ones. But I, I, I forget the term. But there is a term for that. That is that can be a, a, an issue for uh, people who are, are blind. Especially it's not those insomnia, are right? I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not insomnia. No, it's not insomnia in that case, The because it's not that they have trouble sleeping, it's just that their sleep cycle is different from everybody else's. They still get tired, they still wake, they still have a fairly regular cycle. Their cycle is just uh, outside of what a normal cycle would be, so they're more alert you know, at different times of the day than other people, which again, there's nothing necessarily inherently wrong with that, other than if you're trying to interact with other people and you're active when everybody else is asleep and you're asleep when everybody else is active, it can affect your ability to socialize and things along those lines. Sleep inversion sounds right, although I thought it was some, there's some terms similar to that. And no, blind people do not have heightened senses. Right? You don't get to become Spider-Man just because you lose your vision or something along the lines. You just pay more attention to those other, uh, uh, those other senses. Right? When you are, lose one of those symptoms, then you just become more reliant on the other and you pay more attention. We are very visual uh, organisms, uh, and so we are very reliant on our visual system. So we tend to ignore all of our other visuals, other, all of our other senses, but when that's removed from you, then you become more reliant on the others. But your perception doesn't get better, as cool as, as, cool as that would be. All right. Yes, oh, that's right, not Daredevil. Daredevil would be a better example. That is correct. All right, so let's talk about some other hormones produced from some of the other cells, and some of these are ones we've talked about, and some of these are ones we will talk about. Let's talk about this one again. Where is atrial natriuretic peptide produced? Atria. Atria of the heart, excellent. Uh, what is its target? Kidney. And what does it tell the kidney to do? to uh, um, release water to urine. Make there you go, release more water, right? lowers the blood pressure. Excellent, 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 excellent. Here's another one we talked about, erythropoietin. Where is it produced? Red bone marrow. No, that's not where it's produced. That's its target. Oh. Where, is erythro where was erythropoietin produced? 
red blood cells. So the effect is, but where was it actually produced? What was monitoring the condition of the blood to tell us to produce red blood cells? Uh, liver? Close. It definitely would be something that we would want to have a lot of blood going to a lot of the time. Kidneys, there you go, Sandy's got it. It is produced by the kidney. Remember, kidney is monitoring the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. And if that goes down, it produces erythropoietin. Erythropoietin targets the red bone marrow. I would accept that. Although, do we have a more specific target? What hemocytoblast? Excellent. And of course, the effect of erythropoietin produce more erythrocytes. More erythrocytes, and to make them more quickly, mature them more quickly. Remember, we make them more of them and we make them more quickly, we mature them more quickly. Excellent. So those are a couple we've already talked about. Would it work to say erythropoiesis? I'm sorry? Would it work to say erythropoiesis for the, for the effect? Sure. Although it's kind of in the name, but yeah, I would give that. <laughs> Here's another one we've talked about. Where is calcitriol produced? Sorry. I would like to ask how it erythropoietin regulated. Oh, great question. How is, let's go back. You're right. We haven't done that for either of this. Atrial natriuretic peptide. How is this one regulated? Um, primarily because, oh no. There we go. Perfect. Mm -hmm. We got there neuroregulation via stretch receptors, right? It was the stretch of the atria that caused the production of the atrial nitritic peptide. So neural via stretch receptors. Absolutely, excellent. How was erythropoietin regulated? Humorally. Humorally via? Kidney. Red blood cells level, no? It isn't necessarily the number of red blood cells, but what those red blood cells carry. Oxygen. Oxygen. So humorally, the oxygen levels of the blood. Where does calcitriol production begin? The red bone marrow? No. Kidney. No, it, the kidney and the liver are involved. Baroreceptors are also pressure receptors. Yes, that would be acceptable. What's calcitriol the active form of again? Vitamin D. Vitamin D. And where do we get that vitamin D from? Sun. But what part? The sun on our skin. skin. There you go. Exactly. So it starts in skin. You're right, produced by UV radiation, uh, activating some uh, or modifying some cholesterols in our skin to become vitamin D. But you guys are right, vitamin uh, D is converted into its active form by the kidney and by the liver. So again, any of those three answers I would accept for where it is produced. What did we say calcitriol targets again? Um, bone, kidney. No. No. Parathyroid hormone and calcitonin affects the osteoclast, but what does calcitriol actually target? What did calcitriol tell us to do? You get partial credit for digestive system, but we want to be more specific. You're right, absolutely. Small intestine, primarily the small intestine, right? Actually, I'd give you full credit for digestive system but small intestine primarily, because that is primarily where absorption takes place. And of course, what does calcitriol tell the small intestine to do? To reabsorb calcium. To, well, not reabsorb, we're absorbing. We're bringing it in from the food absorb, and the yeah. drink that we have. So we're absorbing calcium from our digestive system. So, how is calcitriol regulated? 
immorally. Say again? Humorally via calcium levels. That's a good guess. Humorally via calcium level seems right, because definitely it involves calcium. However, if you remember, we just finished talking about calcitri uh, pardon me, calcitonin and parathyroid hormone. And remember, one of them caused more calcitriol to be made, and one of them caused less calcitriol to make. So actually, the calcium levels indirectly affect it, but the actual direct effect would be hormonally via parathyroid hormone and calcitonin. Calcitonin inhibits calcitriol production. Parathyroid hormone stimulates calcitriol production. So it actually would be hormonal. Now remember, being the sophisticated student, humorally always means that there is something in the blood that you are counting the numbers of. So humorally via the kidney, are you counting how many kidneys you have? No, so again, it would have to be something that was in the blood. So think of it that way. If it's humorally, it has to be something you can count the numbers of. Now, you're right. Many of the counting of those things occur in the kidneys. There's lots of things that we're looking at in the kidneys as the kidney monitors those things. But again, you'd have to say what that thing is. So yes, I would say calcitriol is controlled hormonally via parathyroid hormone and calcitonin, which remember was released from the thyroid gland. So those, both of those hormones affect calcitriol production. All right, I know it may not feel this way, but these are all hormones we've already talked about. I want to mention these, gastrin, secretin, and cholecystokinin are all hormones of the digestive system that influence the digestive system. There are a half dozen different hormones that we need to talk about when we get to the digestive system, which is where we're going next. So I don't wanna to waste too much time on them here. So for right now, all you need to know for this exam is that three, these are three examples of hormones that are produced by and affect the digestive system. You don't need to know their targets. You don't need to know what they do. You don't need to know how they're regulated. Just know that these are examples of hormones. And if there's any others that you know, you can throw those on as well. Just be able to name one or two hormones that are involved in the digestive system, and that's all we need to worry about for there. So again, in the interest of time, I don't want to spend too much time on this because that's exactly where we're going to go in the next section. In the next section, when we talk about the digestive system for two weeks, we'll talk about a lot about the hormones there. And lastly, and this is an interesting one, what produces leptin? Adipose tissue, excellent. All right, excellent, it, it, it is produced by uh, adipose tissue. What is the target of leptin? Hypothalamus. Hypothalamus, and what are its effects? Regulates body weight. True, absolutely. One of the things that it does is it does give us that sensation of satiousness, of being sated from our meal and being full and stopping eating. Of course, when the first scientists discovered this, they thought they had that golden arrow, that you know, golden medicine that was going to make them rich beyond belief, because now we were going to have a pill that people would be able to take. And when they took that pill, they'd feel full and they wouldn't eat and we'd all be beautiful and they'd be rich. So why aren't we all beautiful and why aren't they rich? Anyone know? <laughs> well, here's why. Because how hungry you are really has absolutely nothing to do with how much you eat. There are so many other factors that determine what people eat, right? Some people feel they have to clean their plates no matter what. Some people just eat as much food as they can in the 30 minutes that they have their break. Some people eat emotionally. 
because they're angry, because they're sad, because they're depressed, because they're horny, whatever the reason are. There's so many other reasons we eat other than being hungry that making someone not feel hungry doesn't stop people from eating. So really, it has no effect that way. Its goal is to do that. But again, there are so many societal and emotional pressures that influence when and how much and what we eat that it really isn't nearly as effective as it could be uh, from something like that. It doesn't mean that leptin is a totally useless hormone. As someone mentioned, it does play a role somewhat in helping to metabolize fats. Uh, but the other big effect that leptin has is that in females, leptin plays a very important role in establishing and maintaining the female um, uh, uh, menstruation cycle, the female's uterine and ovarian cycle. It affects estrogen production. It affects the maturation of eggs, right? Uh, leptin levels, again, has to do with how much fat you have, how much fat you have stored. From a biological standpoint, if you as a female are going to house an infant for 10 months, right, and then give birth to them, you need to be healthy enough and fit enough to be able to do that. And one of the way you show your body shows you, I mean, yeah, well, you show your body or your body shows you either way you want to think of it, that you are capable of carrying an offspring is by having enough fat. So as fat levels increase, leptin levels increase, and that stimulates the production of the uh, uterine and ovarian cycle. There's been speculation that uh, the increase in uh, BMI of adolescents is one of the things that has led to a decrease in the age of the maturation of females, that the, the, the timing of when menstruation begins over the past 40 years has uh, decreased significantly as to our, and it's not uncommon at all for you know, nine and 10 year olds now to actually start menses. Uh, again, for a big time, it was thought they thought it was hormones that were in like the milk and things along those lines. Uh, and so again, now you, it's almost impossible to buy milk that doesn't have two things on it, right? We don't use any RSBT or whatever it is, hormones in the formation of our milk. But then of course, because of the, uh, of the lobbyists, they also have to have an asterisk there that says there have been no studies that show that this causes any kind of problems or anything along those lines. I wasn't going to use anorexia as an issue, although that can occur, but the other place where you see it as well is individuals who are some of these ultra athletes. You know, the people who will just run for the heck of it for 48 straight hours just to see how far they go, or do these 100 mile races, or do these major Ironman triathlons and things along those lines. When a female gets down to, you know, one half a percent body fat, whether because of exercise or whether because of a condition like anorexia, when they get too thin, one of the things that can happen is they can disrupt their periods. Their periods can become more irregular or can actually stop. And the reason for that is the loss of leptin. So that leptin plays an important role in both establishing and maintaining a normal uh, ovarian cycle. All right, questions on that? I think that's everything. Excellent. I like it when it makes sense. Perfect. Oh, and we finished with plenty of time. All right. So that's everything you need to know for this exam. But I fully appreciate that that is a lot. Oh, uh, I don't know how leptin is regulated. Let me think about that. Um, Well, it wouldn't be hormonally. My guess, if anything, it might be humorally. By, uh, you know, how much triglycerides are in the cells or something along those lines. That's a great question. You know what? I don't have an answer for you for that one. So put an X through that. I don't actually know. I'll have to look that up. That's a great question. I guess I'm always so excited to be done. I don't think about it. Uh, this is your cheat sheet to study for the exam. So definitely use this to study for your exam. I would not encourage you to have a cheat sheet for the actual exam, but uh, that is that. All right, excellent. So 
That is all the information that you're covered for. We have about an hour left. So here's what I think we'll do. We'll take one last quick break. Uh, during this break, anybody who wants to run screaming from the building is more than welcome to do that. But when we come back for this break, we'll make it a quick break. We'll just make it a 10 minute break, quick stretch, quick drink, uh, whatever it is that you need to do. And then we'll come back and then I will happily answer any questions that you guys have on the exam. So we'll have an opportunity to do a review. Uh, but again, review isn't me standing up here telling you what I think is important. That's what I do every day through lecture. This is your chance to ask me questions about what it is that you're not understanding so that I can help you to understand it more successfully. So it's 3.34, let's come back at 3.44, and at 3.44, we will pick up from there. So let's go ahead, I'll save this, clear that, and we'll restart Oops. at 3.44. And I'll start the recording for the questions and answers. All right, see you back here in 10 minutes. I am back and I'm yours. So, like I said, this is your opportunity to ask questions, uh, things that you're not clear about on any of the material for this upcoming exam. And remember, as I've said many times, if you don't ask questions, then I assume that means you've mastered the material and I make the test harder. I have a question about last uh, class. Yes. It's about the uh, those pathways, inhibitory and excitatory. Yes. And it all of this about one cell, right? The one cell has different receptors, so different hormones can bind to that to it, right? Yes, theoretically. Now, again, uh, it, for those two pathways, does every single health cell have both of those pathways? No, they may have different ones, but you are absolutely correct. It is quite possible for a single cell to have those and and the the amino acid based one. Right, hormones have the ability, like we've talked about, I mean, how many hormones did we mention today that have the ability to affect the liver? Every single one of those that affect the liver is gonna have its own binding site and its own G proteins and its own enzymes, and they're gonna be a completely different pathway from that. So yes, so absolutely, uh, those can all be on one cell. Okay, thank you. Yep. And you don't want us to distinguish epinephrine and norepinephrine functions? No, for our purposes, they're essentially the same. So there, there are some subtle differences, but nothing that we have to worry about. And for that matter, it's the same thing with uh, triiodothyronine and thyroxine. They're different hormones, so you wanna list them both. Uh, but at the same time, when it comes to targets, when it comes to their functions, they're essentially the same. Is that it? Oh, hold on. On the exam, if you say what produces a specific hormone, is saying the name of the gland sufficient, or would they have to be more specific? Um, I guess it would depend on the question. Uh, I could see a question where uh, you have to say which glands produce which hormones, but uh, especially for like a lab exam, when we're talking about the histology, uh, in many examples, we've talked about the specific cells, the chromaffin cells, the follicular cells, the parafollicular cells. I mean, the, the thyroid gland is a great example. The hormones produced by the follicular cells and the hormones produced by the parafollicular cells are very, very different with very different functions. So I think it's always, I, I, I think the good general rule is it is always better to be more specific than less specific. Uh, conceivably, could there be a question where you just have to say the gland? Sure. Uh, I could see conceivably where that would be a, a, a situation, but probably that would be probably some more like something on the, la on the lecture exam. In the lab exam, I'm probably more likely to, uh, to ask you to identify the specific cell or to ask the question the other way around. I may show you a histology picture of a gland and say, or, or, you know, or like a half head chart of the, of the pineal gland, point at the pineal gland and say what hormone is produced here, or specific hormone, or what class of hormones or something like that. I could see asking the question that way. So that I could see. Yeah. Uh, 
I wouldn't want to go over the entire handout. If there's something specific that you are struggling with, I don't, again, I don't want to take, I don't want the time to go, it would take to go over that entire handout isn't something that I think would necessarily be the best use of our time. Uh, but if there is something particular on that handout that you're confused by, I'm happy to answer that question. Again, at this point, um, you should know how to go through one of these lists and identify these things and recognize these things. But, but if you're having trouble with them, then I'm happy. So if there's specific examples on that, I would happily answer that. But, but I don't think it would be the best use of our time to go through the entire thing. But yeah, but if, you, if there's something specific on that list that you're not sure about, then by all means ask it and I'll happily answer. All right, next question. While well, she looks through that list. Can you explain the, um, the membrane attack complex again? Sure. Thank you. Okay. Um, so obviously that's part of our complement protein system. So in our complement protein system, remember whether it is the classic pathway where we're using antibodies to direct the process and purposely splitting C3 into C3A and C3B, or whether it just happens to be that they spontaneously come apart and there happens to be a pathogen present, one way or another, the key is that C3B attaches to the plasma membrane of, an, of a pathogen, all right? So regardless of which way that happens, you've got that C3 protein embed, C3B protein embedded in the plasma membrane of a cell. Now, as it's sitting there embedded in the cell, then it's an anchor point. So as we talked about, one of the things that it can do is it can attract phagocytes to be able to gobble it up. But there are all these other proteins that are present inside of the blood plasma as well. And so what can happen is that the first one, C5, is going to come and find C3 and attach to it and then C6 attaches to that, and seven, and so on and so forth. So what happens is all of these, now that we have an anchor point, all of the other proteins, those complement proteins, can come, and there's like a half dozen of them that come, and all embed into the plasma membrane. And when they all embed in the plasma membrane, they form a pore in that plasma membrane, and that pore in the plasma membrane opens up a hole where sodium can rush in, and then water's gonna enter in, and cause the cell to lice and rupture. All right. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Hold on a second. I haven't checked. Okay. Uh, so next question. Could you please explain again the uh, positive and negative selection? Okay. So, as we've learned, our T cells are the cells whose job it is to destroy abnormal cells in our body. Those can be cells that are infected. I'm in lecture right now. Uh, it's cells that are cancerous, cells that are foreign, whatever it is, okay? So that's its job. The ability to destroy other cells is a very powerful ability. And so it's not the kind of thing that we want to just occur randomly. So there we, to have an effective T cell, there are two things that we need to make sure that T cell can do, okay? Now, let's get, take a step back. As we talked about, we have all of our cells in our body have proteins that they express on their surface. One of those proteins it expresses on their surface are our major histocompatibility complexes. These are proteins whose job it is to grab something random inside the cell 
and stick it out on the surface. So one time it's gonna grab this. The next time it's gonna grab that. The next time it's gonna grab this. It's grabbing all these things and expressing from inside the cell and expressing them on the surface. The reason for that is if it turns out to be something foreign, right, something that doesn't belong in our body, we want to get rid of those cells that have this thing, right? <clears throat> Towards that end, we need T cells to be specialized. And we need them to be specialized in two ways. The first thing they have to be able to do is they have to be able to connect to that major histocompatibility complex. If they can't connect to the major histocompatibility complex, they can't see what the major histocompatibility complex is shown. Right? So they need to be able to bind to that major histocompatibility complex. If they can't do that, they can't see what it's holding, they can't be activated, they're not going to be any use to us. Well, so, that so, is our, so that is our positive selection. It has to be able to positively bind to our major histocompatibility complexes. So so do you mean that um, uh, pathogen also have this MHC? Yes, uh, they may, but they're not our cells, so we don't care. We don't want it to bind to their major histocompatibility complexes. All we care about is ours. Oh, okay. Okay. Now, a, a bacteria might, but a virus isn't. Uh, a, a pathogenic, uh, a pathogenic uh, worm could. And that would be a good thing too, because if we're able to bind to their major compatibility complexes, they're holding out their foreign antigens, and then we would want to attack that. Okay? So mm -hmm. yes, we need them to bind to major compatibility complexes, and that is the positive selection. But remember, positive selection doesn't mean that the T cell becomes activated. The T cell needs that double recognition. So what happens is not only does it have to bind to the major histocompatibility complex, but it needs to be able to recognize a foreign antigen. So that means if I have a particular shaped antigen that my cells make, do I want my T cell to be activated by that? No. No. So what happens is I need my T cell to be able to bind to the major histocompatibility complex. That is the positive selection but I don't want it to be stimulated by my antigens. If it's stimulated by my antigens, then that means that T cell could attack my cells in my body, and that would be a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And so if it recognizes my antigens, then I have to destroy that because I can't have it. And that is the negative selection. Okay, got it. So it needs to both be able to recognize both the major compatibility complex, positive selection, but not be stimulated by my antigens, negative selection. No, it's clear, okay. I was confused about it. Yep, yep. What's next? Yes, Dylan, for if a, lymph, if a lymphocyte fails either positive or negative selection, then yes, we need to trigger apoptosis in it so that those cells are destroyed because they're not gonna be useful and they're potentially dangerous, so absolutely. So yeah, in both cases, when it fails, and remember, as we said, most of them do. Most of them do die. Most of them are triggered, and we do trigger apoptosis. We do kill most of them only 2% are able to pass both tests. Any more questions? I know we're reaching the end of hour four, and so that's usually when people get fatigued. And um, the dendritic cells are the ones that take a piece and like hold it for other ones to see that it's infected, what the infection looks like, or? 
Correct. Dendritic cells are antigen presenting cells like our phagocytes, uh, like the Kufr cells in the liver. Um, but they're, remember, the ones that are found in the skin. So remember, in the skin, we have those cells, the immune cells that are able to migrate around. Those are the dendritic cells that do two things. They're phagocytes, so that they find something abnormal, they will eat it and express it on the surface as an antigen-presenting cell. But remember, those dendritic cells also contain histamine. So they're the ones that, for instance, when you get hives on the surface of your skin, right, those, you know, from like something like the oils from uh, poison ivy or something like that, uh, they play a role in that inflammatory response as well. So dendritic cells can do both of those things or do do both of those things. And the ones that proliferate are the helper T cells, right? They let off the cytokines and like have more people recruited and then they proliferate. I'm kind of confused on that one. So remember, when the, when the helper T cells are activated, they divide, right? They, okay. up, that they do that rapid division as well. But you're also right, then they start producing chemical signals. And those chemical signals enhance all parts of the immune response. So yes, they stimulate even more division of helper T cells, but they also cause more division and, and, and rapid maturation of the cytotoxic T cells. They're the ones that, uh, that activate the B cells so that they divide, and they enhance inflammation, they enhance phagocytosis, they help every part of the immune response, which is why it's so devastating when they're destroyed. And the regulatory or the same thing as suppressor? Yes, right? those two terms are interchangeable. And again, those are the ones that are much slower to activate, right? They're still gonna get activated by this exposure to this virus but we don't want them activated right away like the, the cytotoxic and the helpers because then they would start suppressing our immune response right away. So they're much, much slower to activate uh, so that we have time to defeat the pathogen and then we turn our immune response off. Whereas the memory cells don't get activated at all. They stay inactive for the entire process. And the memory T cells, they often um, don't stay there either, right? Like they die off? No, memory T cells, memory T cells like memory B cells uh, last for a very long period of time. They can last for years and then some of them can last your entire life. Oh. Yep. Yes, I can do that. Uh, real, real quickly, uh, one other question that was asked uh, privately, so I want to make sure. Uh, obviously, if you don't have questions now, you are always welcome and encouraged to email me. Uh, between now and really Thursday next week uh, about any questions that you have. So I'm always happy to respond to emails and answer questions that way. So if you, if you don't have questions prepared yet uh, and, and something comes up, then yes, by all means, email me. All right, class one and class two major histocompatibility complexes. Let's go through class one first. Which cells express the class one major histocompatibility complex? You guys are instilling me with a lot of faith. All cells? Yeah, pretty much all cells. Pretty much all cells express that class one major histocompatibility complex. Excellent. And what type of antigens does a class one major histocompatibility cell express? Internal or external proteins? Internal. Internal, excellent. So it's expressing internal antigens, antigens that are made in, being made inside of them, right? And so, as was mentioned, as long as it's a normal, healthy cell, it's expressing its own antigens on the surface, and it's not a problem. It's when it's infected, and it's now expressing a viral antigen that then activates a T cell. And which T cell is activated by the class one expressing that internal antigen? Cytotoxic. Yeah, cytotoxic, or CD8. Right, the CD8 ones are the ones that are activated by that, which primarily become the cytotoxic. Excellent. And let's take one more step too. What is the message that it's telling that cytotoxic T cell? Is it saying, go kill this or go kill me? Kill me. Kill me, excellent. All right, class two are presented by what types of cells? B cells. 
Phagocytes. B cells are what else? Phagocytes. Phagocytes, right? Uh, the dendritic cells, the Kufr cells, right? Those are the ones that are the antigen presenting cells for that. Excellent. And what type of antigen is it expressing? An internal protein or an external protein? External. External, excellent. It was either something it found floating around and brought in, or it was something that it brought in gobbled up. Either way, it's taking something that it found outside and expressing it on the surface. What type of T cells does it activate? Class two activates what type of T cell? You have two choices, CD8 or CD4. Class eight. CD4. Oh, CD4. CD4, CD4, excellent. Right, did it activate? Four times two again. Yeah. And does it tell that CD4 to kill me or go kill that? Go kill that. Go kill that, exactly. Excellent. All right, let's get in one more. I'll take one more question, then we'll call it a day. So it uh, calls the helper T cells. The CD4, it's a helper T cell, right? Yeah, but most of them become helper, but some become memory and some become uh, regulatory. Um, have any suggestions for possible essay questions? Well, really, everything someone has asked so far is definitely a good essay question. All of these things are things that could be possible essay questions. Anything that we had major pathways of, you know, that a major processes. Uh, I told you last class that those, uh, the three ways that we uh, uh, modify the behavior of a cell, right? Amino acid based, excitatory amino acid based, inhibitory, and lipid based are definitely questions that are in the pool. Uh, so again, you should, as a, as a sophisticated student, be able to go through and look at the processes, look at the things that we've talked about, and be able to determine the types of things that are going to be essay questions. Absolutely. And again, as I've said before, if you want to write practice essay questions and send them to me, I'm happy to read them and make comments on them too, help you to prepare. All right, any more questions? All right, well then I will remind you again, uh, if any other questions come up, please feel free to email me. I will happily uh, respond to those. Otherwise, study hard. Uh, remember Monday, make sure you get your outline turned in. As soon as you get that outline done this weekend, uh, submit it onto the, uh, I'll be honest, I haven't looked to see if anybody's done it yet. Hopefully somebody has at least. But get in there, make sure they're submitted before 6 p.m. on Monday. Make sure you get that done. Uh, be prepared for your presentations on uh, Tuesday and then Thursday's exam. Have a good weekend. You guys should be very busy. So, uh, and it's good. It's a good thing that the air quality is so poor. You can't go anywhere anyway. You have to be studying hard for this class. So have a good weekend. Have a safe weekend. Listen to the doctors. Don't listen to the politicians. Uh, and register to vote if you have not already. All right, take care. Talk to you guys later. Bye.